The Silver Case is an adventure game that's light on the puzzles and heavy on the story. This was the debut title for Grasshopper Manufacturer back in 1999 on the original PlayStation. Directed, designed, and written by the company's founder, Goichi Suda, or Suda51, along with co-writers Masahi Uka and Sako Kato. This game's narrative came from a deeply personal part of Suda, who was not only inspired by works of art that left an impression on him, but also his own life experiences up to that point, and concern for the future of society. Before he could make a mark on the western lands with his deadly individualism, he was more determined to create a game with a small budget and even smaller staff, all while ensuring his team gets paid. A luxury he didn't have in his last job, but that's a story for another time. It might be a bit of an exaggeration, but not too much to say that The Silver Case is the title that my career lived and died on. If this wasn't a success in 1999, it would have been the end of things for me in the industry. Other countries would have to wait while the Silver Case finds some success in Japan, helping the company establish itself into said industry as they'd go on to develop future projects. But today's focus is... The Silver Case. And just a heads up, so far I've only been showing the original 1999 PlayStation game, but most of this video will consist of footage from the 2016 remake. This remake was co-developed with Active Gaming Media under Suda supervision. This was how most people got to finally play the first ever game created by Grasshopper Manufacturer, including myself. The main difference between the original PS1 game and the remake would be the 3D backdrops and some of the art. Don't get me wrong, I'd probably play with these tasty low-poly backgrounds if I could fluently read Japanese, but I don't think the real artistry behind this game was lost in the remake. All of the artwork by Takashi Miyamoto and Masateru Ikeda can now be presented in their full resolution, and the original score by Masafumi Takada can be heard in crystal clear quality. The only correlation between the versions would be the text boxes, which its presentation was something Suda and his gang were particularly proud of. Text-based adventures were really popular in Japan in 1999. Since this was our first game ever, we were basically an indie company. We had a really small staff of just five people. Since those types of games were popular, we wanted to make a new type of text-based adventure. So that's how we came up with the Silver Case. While the remake saw a few interesting changes, I won't talk too much about the differences between this and the original, as it isn't that important. It's a little hard to describe the Silver Case as a whole experience, and calling it a visual novel feels reductive. Not that I have anything against the genre, it's just that this game feels a lot less static than your typical visual novel. It has a little too much visual feedback to call it a text-based game, but it's also far too minimal to simply call it an adventure game. One of the things I was really unsatisfied with in most text adventure games was that the screen is usually static the whole time. You might have changes in background, but generally it just kind of sits there. I really didn't like that. I wanted to have the screen constantly moving to keep it interesting. It wasn't just the background images, but the complementing aspects and even the sounds. I wanted everything to fit together, like one big working machine. I was going to save this bit for last, but I kind of want this to be heard by as many people as possible. Reading this quote, I think this is why the Silver Case deserved a worldwide release more than any other piece of Suda's earlier work. More than Moonlight Syndrome, more than Super Fire Pro Wrestling Special, the moment Goichi Suda got to step up in the industry with a completely original project, not an installment to an already existing franchise which has its hangups and binds by default, the first literal step he and his team took in production as a brand new team was how can we provide a unique way to tell a story? I emphasize and pontificate this point because I still find people dismiss any discussion or even inference of nuance and depth in Suda's games. Besides the very existence of The Silver Case, this initial concern for unique narrative and direction should already be a tell that he values story above all else in his games. Obviously, I can't speak for the Grasshopper games which he wasn't the director, but regarding every original piece he did direct, hell yeah the story's important, probably the most important part to him, and that's why I don't think it's folly nor wrong to analyze these games. He's always trying to say something with his stories. So, back to this big working machine. It is presented through an engine Grasshopper internally developed called Film Window, which allowed them to form and reshape the portraits, text boxes, and such however they'd like. 
And for 1999, that was really impressive. No character models to speak of either as the only things accompanying you in these three dimensional rooms are two dimensional portraits as you explore in one dimensional person. Uh, first person. The silver case is chill. The silver case is harrowing. The silver case is exciting. The silver case is creepy. The silver case is amazing. The silver case is boring. It's so many different things in so many separate instances as it refuses to stick to a single theme or even style. In this video, I'll go over the entirety of the story and my overall thoughts on the kind of tale this game wanted to tell. Spoilers from here on out, it's recommended that you have at least played both the transmitter and placebo portions of the Silver Case before watching this. If you haven't, go play them already. The Silver Case is on PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Steam, GOG, and most recently Nintendo Switch bundled with its direct sequel. And as I've recommended in previous videos, write down names of characters, and maybe a couple details the first time around. It'll help you keep up with the story as it unfolds and not get confused between all of these very human characters and their traditional names from a country you likely aren't accustomed to. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I had a hard time keeping track of such things the first time around, especially when the entire art direction completely changes. Maybe even have this chart with you handy as it'll help you keep track of everyone as well. But first, a word from a familiar sponsor. <laughs> what? Sukaban NYC has rolled out a new line of badass and unique streetwear. As always, they work with some of the best artists, including Ilya Kuvshinov with these new shirts. And I hope some recognize this Grasshopper alumni. Nico Shogun, the character designer for a Lollipop Chainsaw, illustrated this original barbed wire piece. Please check out sukaban.nyc. Type that shit in an open window. I know you got two monitors. Stop playing Vampire Survivors while watching this and visit sukaban.nyc. Use the code GENRYSC23 to get 15% off your whole purchase as they've got tons of other cool stuff on sale too. Again, that code is G-H-E-N-R-Y-S-C-2-3. <laughs> Before discussing the story, I want to talk about the quote-unquote gameplay. Suda has said with the way he approaches visual novel games, he wanted it to be more than just clicking and reading, which is tricky in my opinion. I think the degree of how much a visual novel feels like just clicking and reading depends on how engaging the story is to the player. Of course, the Silver Case does try to have a lot more style and visuals than your typical VN, especially in the 90s with its dynamic scenery shots, full animation bits, and 3D environment. This was all present in the original game on PlayStation, with the remake expanding on said visuals. I personally love the mood of the silver case throughout. Feels like a game you should play in the middle of the night with all the lights out, only the screen illuminating your face as you read walls of heavy typing text. Needless to say, the gameplay is very basic and straightforward, so it doesn't really leave me with anything else to say. The presentation is what's really worth discussing over that. The Silver Case provides a certain type of mood throughout, from the visuals in the background, to the style of the portraits, to the original music compositions. The Silver Case also has multiple perspectives in regards to the story's structure. There's Transmitter, which serves as the side A of these cases, if you will. Transmitter always follows the heinous crimes unit members, where you play as the quote-unquote main character, which you get to name, with all the artwork illustrated by Takashi Miyamoto. And this game's B-side is Placebo, where you play as Tokyo Morishima, an investigative journalist has cigarettes for breakfast and sleep for dinner, and dinner time is whenever the hell he feels like it. Transmitter and Placebo were mainly written by Goichi Suda and Masahi Uka, respectively, the latter receiving writing assistance from Sako Kato. The Placebo chapters are certainly less exciting than the heinous crimes unit's head-first dive into these dark mysteries, but Tokyo's reports and summaries serve as a way for the player to better understand 
understand the situations and attain a firm grasp of the story they just witnessed. You're also receiving a completely different perspective on each main case, which is further emphasized on the fact that Placebo's portraits are by a completely different artist, Masateru Ikeda. In a certain way, Tokyo is a living, breathing player's guide in the world of the Silver Case. I guess that only makes sense if you consider the story to be part of the gameplay itself. Which I do. And so does Suda. In a way of speaking, the script of the game itself is actually the gameplay, you know? So it ends up being a gameplay design document for anybody reading as well. It kind of makes sense that Suda would assign Masahi Uka with a job like this. Before the silver case, Uka wrote the official visual guide for Moonlight Syndrome, a horror adventure game Suda directed and wrote back in 1997. Moonlight Syndrome is something we'll thoroughly talk about one day, probably. But like the silver case, Moonlight Syndrome's gameplay was very minimal, rarely did the game ask you to do more than walk to a destination and simply read or listen to character dialogue. So while I can't read Japanese myself, I'm to presume said guide doesn't even describe the gameplay, just story elements and characters. And let me tell ya, Uka can write a character or two. So, don't misunderstand how I'm describing Tokyo's escapades in this game. He gets a lot of great tales of intrigue exclusive to his chapters. However, Uka's main objective regarding Placebo was to make absolute sense out of Suda's crazy plots while having his characters show the most of their humanity. When it comes to Placebo, a lot of the focus is on the characters' traits, their struggles, what makes them a person. With that said, I'll look over Tokyo's own stories within this game far into the video like, after all the transmitter chapters. You see, Placebo does have its own unique stories that Tokyo goes through personally, but it's also mixed in with intrigue regarding the adjacent transmitter story, so for the sake of analyzing the game, it would be really messy if I went over them in the order presented. Instead, I'll discuss each chapter's main story as a whole, including what we learn in Placebo, while saving Tokyo and his own endeavors for a separate section later on. This will make it much easier to get an idea of what kind of character he is and what Uka was expressing with him. I guess I'll also give one last warning. While I do describe a lot of the story heavily in this video, I still think it's better to go through the game yourself before watching my analysis. And as I've said in previous videos, I went into this over case as a fan of games like No More Heroes and others, I had no clue what I could even expect from the visual novel-esque crime thriller, and even then I left it as a bookmark to look into later as I began analyzing Suda51's more high-profile titles on this channel. But once I got into it, god damn. Playing games like this, Flower, Sun and Rain, and The 25th Ward forever warped how I look at Suda51 as a creator. For the better, of course. He has so much more nuance than I realized back then, and experiencing them definitely helped me understand how he approached games like Travis Strikes Again and No More Heroes 3. The Silver Case was Grasshopper Manufacturer's debut title, but it's also the starting point for all of the games we made afterwards. I want people to know that the roots of Grasshopper are here. It's more than just an old school visual novel. It was a challenge for the 30 year old me. This is something that I want gamers around the world, as well as young gamers to know. What I'm trying to say here is, don't feel too intimidated just because you've only played Grasshopper's action games. The Silver Case might be a bit slow moving at times, but I think it does a great job enveloping you into its world, so long as you do your best keeping track of said world and its characters. So think of this moment as your last warning before I get deep into the game. Please, try to play the Silver Case yourself at least once, and please, play the chapters in order and then come back if you wish to hear my deepest thoughts on this title. With that said, there's your last warning as we move on. Some might think it's redundant to go over each story, and while I'm not doing an absolute play-by-play -play of the chapters, the reason I'm going to be especially descriptive is because writing it all out helped me understand pretty easily what was going on in the game. So I'm hoping this will be the same case for you, the viewer, when you watch and listen to the video. I'm sure a number of you watching this play through the game with very little comprehension of what actually happened. That's totally normal, I was no different my first time around. But I think at this point, about 10 playthroughs later in the span of 6 years, I have a better understanding. Getting down with the details will also make it easier for everyone watching to see where I'm coming from when analyzing each chapter as well. Just uh, do your best to pay attention, okay? 
That's all I ask. The introduction video is a flurry of information and visuals you'll experience throughout the game, showcasing and teasing the crime thriller you're about to witness. The remake received its own unique introduction with a new mix by Akira Yamaoka, but I much prefer the original, both audibly and visually. Now, just before we start the adventure, I wanted to gush a bit about the title screen from the original game. It's very striking. I'll even say it gives me a similar vibe to Killer7's title screen. It's more interesting than what the remake ended up with, in my opinion. So, with that nitpick aside, we're peering into this bizarre world of heinous crimes and the unit responding to them. Oh, and we need to name our pro tag. I'll just go with the name me and my friends use for the majority of our acting stream. Blakira. This case starts with a very blunt and weighty introduction to Ward 24. It describes how the population increase has caused the 24 wards to get segmented into five different areas. Among these areas, the majority consists of lower class citizens, and this divide is allegedly caused by how the higher class citizens can easily attain information. Sort of an analog for access to the internet in the early years. This is 1999, so it makes sense that not a lot of people had access to the internet. I'm not sure how quickly that caught on to local homes in Japan, but I got dial-up connection pretty early on myself in the US, also around the year 1999. I think the first website I went to was amandaplease.com. But yeah, I was a bit of an early web surfer, and now look at me. Anyway, crime has gone rampant, and it's all the news sources are covering these days. Under Mayor Hachisuka, the police department creates a division known as the Heinous Crimes Unit a team of specialists that deal with violent and disturbing crimes, which contains multiple seasoned cops hired to stop criminals in their tracks. Which they practically never really do in this game. We head over to one of said seasoned officers, Tetsugoro Kusabi, the first main character we meet. Tetsugoro is as gruff and hard-boiled as they come, from the looks of it, very opinionated and considerably foul-mouthed. Literally every shot of him in this game has him looking slightly annoyed. Anyway, he hits the brakes, seeing someone in the middle of the road holding what looks like a dismembered head by their long hair in one hand and a revolver in the other. Sporting some real wicked energy, he fires at Tetsu, who barely avoids the bullet. He calls in to continue the pursuit, but covert cops need to be sent out as the area is outside of HCU's jurisdiction. Tetsu goes to meet up with them as the first part of the prologue ends. We're then lurched into a shitload of text that further describes the 24 wards. Look at all these organization names they throw at you. The TRO, for one, is a faction that specializes in technological advances due to lacking natural resources. What does that mean? I don't know. But within them came the anti-conflict reforms. But this is where the covert ops mentioned before come in, a form of competition for the HCU. These ops are known as the Republic, and this team within them is led by Daigo Natsume, who handled the decades-old incident that shook Japan known as the Silver Case, along with Tetsugoro Kusabi. They appear to be more along the lines of special forces compared to the HCU, which you'll come to learn are more along the lines of detectives. Natsume commands the team that your character is a part of, and this is their first real mission. Besides this stupidly heavy world-building introduction, the presentation I criticize the most is its character identification. It's hard to keep up with all these basic names as they quickly appear on screen, just to fade like half a second later. Anyway, Natsume is driving his team to the perpetrator's location, the Cauliflower Building. With him are Sakamoto, Inomata, and the silent protagonist, Blakira. You. Sakamoto is the only experienced grunt here while Inomata is a nervous wreck on the first mission and Blakira is as calm as ever. As they get to the scene, we see a full moon brightly shining in the background. A sign of transformation. <laughs> That's why this chapter is called Lunatics, I suppose. Cha 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 cha. Kusabi and Natsume catch up a bit, mostly relishing in what they're leaving for the youth, the next generation, what they're passing down to them. The Republic team is prepared, and this serves as a tutorial, giving you a moment and descriptions on how to move and interact in the game. Inomata gets a bit hot-headed in the middle of it, though. Sakamoto heads to back up Inomata, while Natsume tells you that there's a really stupid puzzle to solve. The transmitter side of this game has a handful of puzzles, but most of them are monotonous crap, so the remake has the courtesy to auto-solve most of them if you click this icon. The ones I don't find engaging are the ones I use the cheat button on. Thank you. 
Blakira finds a girl sitting in the other room. She's in total shock, but alive. We find an enraged Inomata in the upper floor, who's directed to support the girl in shock, but she's gone missing. Meanwhile, Sakamoto finds another girl's body, decapitated. You go to the roof to find the deviant from earlier, only to find the missing girl babbling and holding the head that likely belonged to the corpse Sakamoto came across earlier. These depictions of headless corpses are fairly obscure here, and were even more so on the original PlayStation. This is related to a real-life event in Japan that caused the government to make strict rules against depictions of dismemberment in fiction, but we'll talk about that later in the video. You continue to look for the gunman, only to get in his sights as the moon unshrouds. He rambles a death threat over and over again, but in between this madness of letters lies unique statements. I didn't do anything. That woman killed them. Just wanted to protect Mika. Forgive me. Please don't kill me. I really don't want to do this. Natsume shouts at you to take the shot, but you don't move a muscle. Tatsugoro Kusabi comes in to take it for you and then proceeds to blast away at the lunatic's face. What he says to Sakamoto and your chinchilla-shaped face are about how he treats crime, what his mindset sees it as. It's a very potent remnant of popular cop and vigilante movies from decades before this game. And for what it's worth, Tetsu here is acting above the law, killing outside his jurisdiction. A ghost appears in the middle of this, our first paranormal occurrence. The remaining girl points her gun at you, making her the next target for your squad. As you get her in your sights, she rambles about justifying her murders and threatening all those who witness. Her final devotion to Kamui before her life ends. The lion has awakened, and this is only the beginning. Vanishing point. The Silver Case. So, there's a lot of interesting things going on in this prologue, but I'm not surprised if most players were completely unaware. I certainly wasn't aware back in 2016. The thing is though, a lot of the intrigue comes from the previous game Suda directed, known as Moonlight Syndrome, back when he was a part of Human Entertainment. Before Grasshopper, these characters you came across all had their own history before this. Of course, this is never stated in the Silver Case, likely due to rights issues. This would later be confirmed by data miners of the original game, along with a prequel comic that came with the physical copies of the 2016 remake. I'll talk more about these elements once I'm able to experience Moonlight Syndrome in its entirety myself with a complete proper translation. Maybe I should cover the original Twilight Syndrome games even before that, I don't know. By the time I'm recording this, I've only played 6 of the 10 chapters with the help of a fan translation as well as a visiting relative that studied Japanese. Although it's interesting to consider what Suda was doing with this scenario, bringing back these characters he developed just to have them get dragged and torn down the way they were. As an introduction, I can't help but call it messy. Spewing so much information at you without any real context, relying on an arguably unrelated game for some character context, although the latter half is pretty excellent. It gives you an idea of what kind of game this will be for the most part, and sets up the premise really well. A task unit on the hunt for crime in order to dispose of it, ending with a small tease of the supposed main villain, Kamui. Reminds me of other adventure games that tease and infer this big bad who may not be physically around for the entire game, but certainly let their presence be known throughout. Characters like Tetsugoro Kusabe describing crime like a disease or virus is interesting too. It feels like something a police force believes in without actually saying out loud. They never see these culprits as victims of any kind of societal oppression or mental instability. Like Tetsu said, they're just pieces of shit that deserve to be wiped out of existence. Will this remain as such throughout the game? We'll just have to see. This chapter also serves as a good thesis for the entire game and what Suda wanted to explore when writing and directing The Silver Case. Through the world of The Silver Case, we're exploring the essence of the formless power of crime as it is propagated. People, genetics, will, neighbors, lifestyle, the city, time, tradition, plots, plans, analysis, and network crimes are birthed from various places, and in opposition to it stands justice. 
And here is our first example of a criminal for this story. Why would someone commit a crime? For this example, it happened to be due to the horrors of life an individual suffered. Thus, this power of crime grew inside them. You don't really have to have played Moonlight Syndrome to understand these are victims of severe trauma and are so broken that they're taking it out on each other and any random bystanders who happen to be officers of the law. So in the end, they paid the ultimate price, met their fate through the help of someone who believes they stand for justice. Let's also look at the chapter through the lens of the song that the end screen references. This is how I'll end each chapter we look over. Seems appropriate since it's literally how each chapter ends. Vanishing Point is a song performed by New Order back in 1989. All of this game's chapters end with a song title by Joy Division or New Order. Anyway, some notable lyrics are, Grow up children, don't you suffer, at the hands of another. If you like a sleeping demon, listen. Can you hear him weeping? This makes me think of the mad-driven kids trying to kill the officers. They've grown up from their childhood innocence and are reduced to psychopaths due to the trauma that they experienced. The sleeping demon makes me think of Kamui, who according to Tetsu, has now awoken. I've been through a point of no return. I've seen what a man can do. I've seen all the hate of a woman too. An easy guess is Ryu Kazan, the unfortunate individual who... Ugh, just went through a mess of hell in Moonlight Syndrome. It could also be in reference to the conversation Tetsu and Natsume had about their kids and the next generation. So yeah, I find the majority of this song very fitting for the chapter and what was described in it. The song is a soothing lullaby to these kids who have gone through hell and back only to see the end of a gun, a deeply morose conclusion to their story. The scene opens up with a secret meeting at the batting cages between Tetsu from earlier and Ryu Munakata, a death filing agent who I don't believe has any specific affiliation. It's been a couple months since the cauliflower incident from the prologue. Munakata suspects that Kamui will awaken soon, similar to Tetsugoro's thoughts from before. Next we get a more proper introduction to Kamui Uehara the pinned antagonist of the game. He was arrested back in 1979. He was put under observation for years and was declared to have deep mental disorders, whereas even his criminal trial was cancelled, and he was instead admitted into a psychiatric hospital. More recently, he managed to escape, leaving the corpse of his murdered counselor in his wake. The Republic team was dispatched to catch him on his tracks that same night in a forest. We're immediately informed that it failed, leaving only a sole person alive and conscious. You! Or... Blakira. Natsume is alive, but in a coma. This is Decoy Man. Here is where we meet Sumio Kodai, a younger member of the Heinous Crimes Unit. Him and Tetsu are talking to a doctor to get up to speed about Kamui's escape. The doc casts doubt on Kamui's ability to kill someone, considering his current state, but things aren't adding up. If he was literally unable to kill that woman, then what really happened? We're treated to a flashback of the mission. A satellite was tracking Kamui's position, and the Republic's main objective was to bring him in alive. Natsume reminds them why they're here, and Sakamoto states something interesting. He says that they need to possess the criminal power stronger than the criminals themselves do, as it helps them overcome these situations. Regardless, the mission goes awry pretty quickly, with both Sakamoto and Inomata dying in the process. Thought they were going to be main characters? You silly goose, they weren't even in the intro. Natsume decides to perilously go for Kamui himself, a move even he is aware is folly. Before getting subdued, he asks you a particular question. Do you know the phrase, flower, sun, and rain? This has baffled players like myself for years since it's the name of Suda's next game, although I was recently informed that it was the title of an old rock song by a Japanese band, PYG. I asked prestigious Grasshopper fan Steel Ball Runner about interpreting the lyrics of the song, and this is what I received. Shot in the dark, I think it's at least partially about a man who can't find happiness, who finds nothing but hatred and animosity wherever he goes. He continues to live and move from place to place as he looks for some kind of peace or content. This man never loses hope. This might be worth looking into deeper when I attempt to analyze the game that shares the title of this song. But for now, I think it's possible that Natsume might be talking about Kamui. How that's the case, you'll come to learn. 
Of course, that's assuming Natsume is talking about the song in the first place. He tells you that Kamui isn't here, but he's close. A ghastly figure appears behind Natsume and presumably attacks him. So that brings us back to the hospital. Tetsu and Sumio get called in on a recent discovery and decide to bring Blakira with them. Huh? What's up with this chinchilla anyway? Chinchilla? Ah, it's kind of a shitty chinchilla. nickname after all. This guy, he's got a face like a fucking private detective. In that case, maybe like private dick chinchilla? No, that's not it. He's sort of a big guy. Big private dick chinchilla. No, that sucks. I got it. Just shorten it to big dick. Big dick. Big dick. That's a cool sounding nickname. You head to the sewers, the latest crime scene possibly perpetrated by Kamui. Not that you're of much help as the gang tries to make heads or tails out of this situation. A couple of faceless cops mention they don't know anything about Kamui. Apparently the entire concept of him and this crime virus aren't really mainstream. Yet. The hanging body is sent to autopsy while the remaining crew investigate the rest of the sewers, running into another ghost and a doll playing an audio tape. It's an ominous message. The next scene puts us in the HCU headquarters, where we receive a more proper introduction of the main characters. We got Shinji Kotobuki, the head honcho of this team, oldest member and director of the crew. Then there's Agent Morichika Nakatagawa, a well-dressed man who seems to be well-connected. And of course, we've got Tetsugoro Kusabi, our salty detective. The description hints us of his softness beneath the smoky shell, as it describes the love and worry he has for his daughter Turiko. Then there's Sumio Kodai, who often works alongside Tetsugoro. He tends to just care about getting the job done and stopping crime. Next is Chizuru Hachisuka, the only female member of the HCU. Works in forensics and profiling daughter of Mayor Hachisuka. And finally, there's Kiyoshi Morikawa, an older hand with a lot of experience in the field. Also, I have to take a second to appreciate the stylish way they were all introduced. Full body shots next to the descriptions sliding and popping in nicely, and those long beeps before their introductions. With all this, I picture each of them checking into the office one by one like they're getting their key cards scanned individually as they enter. It's so dope, and one of the best examples of pure style Suda51 and his crew provided with this game. Nakatagawa fills us in on this current case. Kamui Uehara is at large with four dead bodies under his name, presumably hiding somewhere in the 24 wards. According to reports, Kamui was physically involved with Yuriko Sonoda, but it's inferred that it was not consensual from his own end as he was also declared impotent. No, Tetsu, that's not what that means. By the way, I'm calling him Tetsu from now on. It's cute. Either way, it's believed Yuriko led Kamui out of the hospital before she got killed. They also discuss the other victim, Yuka Kawai, found hanging in the sewers. Tetsu notes that she was not murdered in the sewer, according to the autopsy, but that her body was moved to the sewer after she was killed. He notes that this is very much not like Kamui. And lastly, all the information they have on Kamui, who even Nakatagawa admits doesn't make a whole lot of sense. He's a man overtaken by an evil darkness. They talk like they don't even consider him to be a human anymore. So, this HCU team is split into two groups, Nakatagawa, Kotobuki, and Hachisuka, who usually stay in the headquarters researching collected evidence and other sources, while the rest of the crew being Sumio, Tetsu, and Morikawa, who go out on the field to investigate scenes. The team breaks as we fade into an alluring shot of Kamui. <laughs> April 9th, about a week later, and Tetsu's getting into a fight with Hachisuka, protesting the stakeout he's assigned to before Sumio calms him down to compliance. However, some plans get delayed as Munakata provides Tetsu a lead. As Blakira is spending quality time reading a threatening email, you get a call to join Tetsu at the Babylon Shopping Center. Why he calls in Blakira, I'm not sure. Perhaps he thinks he's driven by a vendetta for the Republic team? Before we continue the story, I guess it's worth bringing something up now that we've gotten a taste of these characters and how they interact with each other. The translation job for this game has been a matter of controversy amongst Grasshopper followers. According to bilingual fans, their mannerisms and way of speaking to each other are vastly different in the original game. Tetsu doesn't curse as much, Sumio isn't as rude, these kinds of things. I can't say with certainty because I don't know the original language. 
So what makes the Silver Case different from Suda51's other games like Killer7 and No More Heroes in that regard? Well, for one thing, most of the characters in those games are fully voiced. I like this place. Kind of run down, but homey, you know? I didn't come down here to chit chat. Just tell me what I need to know. You mind if I ask you something? Yeah, what is it, Mr. Cosplay? We're both assassins, right? Why do we have to kill each other anyway? If you ask me, it's absolutely meaningless. It's about determining who's best. That's what it's about. Can't argue with that. And for those that might not know, these games had no Japanese voice acting in their original releases. Except where appropriate, like for a joke or whatever. <laughs> In other words, the English voice acting was part of those worlds that Suda and his crew were building, with no intent to provide a speaking language of his own country. Much like the original Resident Evil and Silent Hill games, the English voices were part of his original direction and he wrote what he wanted them to say, with the help of interpreters for the final drafts, of course. Man! This is what I live for, fighting your own kind. Nothing's more gratifying. That in turn probably helped build the world and provide a proper direction for any non-voice dialogue and descriptions, I'm sure. But the Silver Case? All they've got to work with is Japanese text and some portraits regarding these characters. So I figured who can really shine some clarity for the fans? Who else but the interpreter himself? My name is James Mountain, nowadays commonly known as Grasshopper James. My official title is Community Manager, obviously like game localization, translation and interpretation for like internal external meetings, communication, stuff like that, domestic as, as in Japanese, and uh, overseas PR, marketing, pretty much anything having to do with like translation or interpreting or just words in general. That's pretty much my gig. I started working at Grasshopper officially just over a year ago, it was last June. I've been working with Suda and Grasshopper in general for about seven years now. And as far as the titles I've worked on, I did the localization for Silver Case, 25th Ward, Travis Strikes Again, and No More Heroes 3. I got in touch with James because it's not just important to know exactly what got translated to what, but also the reason behind changes and differing interpretations. I'd like to thank Shanky, creator of the Travis Dies Again Twitter page, for helping me connect with James Mountain. I'd also like to shout out the following Grasshopper fans for helping me come up with questions for James as well. Big thanks to Mackerel Phones, Adrian VG, Dreambaum, Steelball Runner, Death Grip San, and Cullen. You've probably seen James Mountain before if you watched any recent interviews with Suda. I got to speak with James for a good while as we not only discussed his hard work translating the entirety of the Silver Case, but also about his immigrant life in Japan, his job as an editor for Automaton Media, and our shared dislike for sushi. I asked him how he was able to land this gig and what it took to convince Grasshopper that he would be fit to become the main interpreter, not just for the Silver Case, but also Suda's work from here on out. My, my previous company, uh, the CEO, basically went to Suda directly and said, hey, you guys have this game called the Silver Case, and it's kind of known as like, you know, an unlocalizable game, but I've got to do who can localize this shit. Just give us give us a shot and let us show you what we can do. And at first they were pretty skeptical. They're like, okay, yeah, well, you know, whatever. We've heard that before, but go ahead and try it. And um, yeah, he gave me a chunk of the game. I localized the shit out of shit. And uh, apparently they were impressed enough to be like, okay, you guys got the job. You know, from how James puts it, you could almost consider it was his skills that finally got the game officially interpreted, as the Silver Case somehow built a reputation in Japan as being unlocalizable before he proved himself to them. Some important context here, Suda has shown off a DS version of the Silver Case and its sequel in the past, but according to him, he didn't find the translation job to be satisfactory and cancelled the whole thing. I've heard uh, also from, from Suda personally, that I've heard from other members of Grasshopper at the time that it wasn't up to standard. I don't know what exactly was wrong with it. I don't know if it was like, it was just a completely direct translation or if somebody just stuck a bunch of shit in Google Translate and came out all gibberish or I don't know what it was. But from what I understand, there was an almost complete translation, several attempts at localization, basically the, the same thing that, that my former company did. You know, the, the dude would approach Grasshopper and say, hey, we can localize this game and they'd give them a shot. And they'd be like, yeah, this, this just isn't it. Sorry, man. Yeah, that's my understanding is that uh, apparently 
it just didn't seem to be up to standard, I guess, yeah. I think this speaks for how important the game is to him, and that he wasn't going to accept some half-assed translation that would change the story, or something that's too one-to-one -one with the Japanese text, which usually leads to stilted, unnatural dialogue. James also wanted the game to feel a bit more like a western hard-boiled crime thriller, but without mutating any of the characters nor belittling the story's details. I did have one or two specific Japanese TV shows and movies and stuff in mind, but I was definitely more conscious of making it feel like a more Western, kind of hard-boiled, slightly old-school, gritty cop drama or something. Something along the lines of, for example, Dirty Harry or something like that set in like, you know, the, the 70s, early 80s or something. You know, you had a lot of these like gritty cop movies and TV shows and everybody's constantly smoking cigarettes like in the office and saying fuck, fuck, fuck and, you know, <laughs> dropping slurs left and right all casually and stuff. Yeah, I definitely tried to make it, uh, I guess, as much as a Western style sort of, you know, gritty, hardcore, like police drama type thing, as opposed to like straight up translating it in English and making it really like Japanese style, but written in English, if that makes sense. So some references are obviously removed, some were even added, but that certainly isn't the only thing people discussed and debated regarding this interpretation. Folks discussed a few of the character's mannerisms, and the best example, I think, would be the salty tongue on Tetsugoro Kusabi. Seriously, I think he's got a naughtier mouth than Travis Touchdown. Here's how James reflects on interpreting the character and what he added through interpretation. Kusabi is hands down my favorite character of the entire series and honestly I, I don't know what it is it's just when i when i first got the files uh, the text files and was reading through them all i'm like this sabi dude like i i really like this guy like i, I really want to do something special with this guy you know and i mean by something special i didn't mean i'm gonna make him say fuck a whole bunch of times because that's hilarious but i mean I'm immature as hell, so like that that was kind of part of it too, but I read through the entire thing like several times, looked at a bunch of like actual game footage and stuff, and just sort of, how do I put it? I guess you could say I kind of came up with my own interpretation of not just uh, like, for example, okay, this character is going to use this specific slang word a lot or something like that, but the, the way they express themselves and like, you know, not just like certain phrases or something, but okay, this character is, uh, is going to be a lot more like upfront and like kind of like full on with what they want to say. And this character is going to be a bit kind of holding back a bit, or this character is going to be a bit more polite or like formal. This character is going to be a bit more like vulgar, you know? I took you know, a lot of hints and, uh, and clues from, from the original text itself. I didn't want to just completely, you know, rearrange a character to make you know somebody who is like really like smart and uh and like formal and and polite i don't want to turn him into like some vulgar caveman or something like that but i i did want to make sure that each character had as much of uh, their own distinct personality and uh manner of expression and mannerisms as possible there were certain things for example like you mentioned kasabi he uh he's got a pretty dirty mouth kasabi written in english is uh, I stayed as faithful to the Japanese as possible, but as far as like the the really specific tweaks and you know like the swearing and stuff like that, I thought okay, if I was this guy in this situation, how would I say this? And I pretty mm. much just wrote the shit out like that. So uh, you know, as you mentioned, Sabi has a bit more. I mean, even more of a filthy mouth than Travis. I uh, I've got a bit of a problem with that myself in real life. And uh, when I was about maybe a third of the way through the game, my uh, my boss at the time was reading through the text. He's like, James, this is basically you, man. I'm like, yeah, I know. I did that on purpose. He's like, but somehow it actually fits, too. I'm like, yeah, I got really lucky. You know, this, I just kind of feel a connection with this guy. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm, I'm nowhere as like cool and like badass as Xavi, but I figure, okay, this is this guy says a lot of the kind of stuff that I would probably say. And this guy, if he was speaking English, I feel this is the way he would express it, which is pretty much how I would too. So I added a lot of like the, you know, the, the swearing and sort of colorful language and stuff, uh, stuff like that to, to, again, to Xavi in particular. I understand some people being taken aback by this interpretation of the character, especially fans that understand both Japanese and English. But if you ask me, I, I think it fits middle-aged detective in the 90s who can basically be an asshole all he wants. His seniority personally grants him tenure. Apart from that, I don't think his surly language detracts from the story at all. In conclusion, well, in my opinionated conclusion, there's nothing that offensive in regards to liberties that James Mountain took. A rice ball is still a rice ball so to speak. Some references to Japanese culture were changed or replaced, but as far as I can tell, the story is still the same, which is the most important part, I think. 
But back to the case at hand. You get to the mall first and are coerced into starting this hunt. Tetsu fills you in on Kamui's next potential victim. Yeah, you, you got it. I'll look out for a woman with those details. In this game that has zero real-time rendered character models. It's, it's not just me, right? This is weird. Blakira dawdles around the mall and runs into this spiky-haired idiot chanting Kamui's name. He's actually Tokyo, the main character from the Placebo chapter. He's mid-trance, but uh, we'll talk about him later. You also run into another ghost pleading for help, and the civilian you just found declares you're Kamui. What? Finally, you find the woman you seeked out, laying on top of the glass roof of the mall before she smashes down to your level. April 10th, back to square one. The HCU look into other possible leads, including a place where Kamui used to work. Studio Gladiolus. A current employee named Ayame claims to have worked with him. Hachisuka criticizes Sumio's decision to immediately investigate there since this is one of the many jobs Kamui had, but he goes with his gut anyway as Tetsu was sent home. Sumio pulls his best gruff detective persona to Ayame in the studio, which comes off as awkward. However, he already starts to get a little smitten over her as well. Sumio lays on the accusations pretty quickly despite having zero evidence that she's even seen Kamui lately. Lo and behold, his hunch was right. Maybe Sumio does have a good nose. Is this really the Kamui Urahara, our antagonist, bound and gagged by Ayame in this closet? Back at the HCU, Kamui remains captured, but according to Hachisuka, he is aphasia deficient, meaning he can't really do much, not even speak or read. Because of this, he would likely be sent to a hospital immediately, but Nakatagawa gets the idea to keep this whole thing under wraps, giving them time with him. Ayame has been captured too, and Hachisuka is ordered to keep watch of her. Sumio and Morikawa debate what to do with Kamui, also noting he's mouthing shelter repeatedly. We also learn Nakatagawa came from the Central team, meaning he isn't exactly affiliated with the HCU. That'll be important later on. As they try to rationalize how the heck Ayame was able to capture Kamui, it becomes increasingly obvious there's more to it than that. As they've stated before, Kamui is barely capable of walking in this current state. Never mind killing. But then, a gunshot! Achisuka's hit, and Ayame got away. Although never explicitly stated, she likely took Hachisuka's gun at a moment of distraction. Blakira and Sumio head to the division shelters. Another hunch, perhaps? While never described, these could be public air raid shelters that wouldn't really be out of the ordinary. That's been a thing in Japan for a long time. While looking for Ayame in these shelters, you run into a few kids. They seem to be playing some sort of game and don't feel they're in any real danger. Sumio finds Ayame and the two get into a little standoff. He can't quite pull the trigger, even when Ayame threatens to kill the kids. I'm kind of, oh, my bad. I'm kind of happy. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay then, can I ask? You something? <laughs> you something? <laughs> she states the three murdered women were their mothers, and Kamui is the father to all of them. <laughs> Boy can't walk, can't talk, and he's still pounding puss across the ward and you can't even get her to text you back. Ayame also admits she killed those women, not Kamui, and attempts to take her own life, but doesn't go through with it as the children surround her. April 29th, back at the precinct, Nakatagawa gets us up to speed. Ayame is in prison, and the children, now motherless, were put into a facility. They also discovered FSO-owned documents of Kamui's origin. The FSO has had tabs on him at all times. He was born in a place called The Shelter, which is believed to be part of a top secret management training program for people. They also theorize that the kids have some sort of secret sense for Kamui, which is what led them to the shelters you found them in, as it was a place Kamui frequents. Nakatagawa goes on to explain that Kamui sees that place as an emulation of where he grew up, which also explains why he got locked up so often, meaning he feels more at peace when he's in this small confinement. He was raised in the darkness that was the shelter. It sounds like all Kamui wants is a place he can call home. Tetsu comes back from his little break, and they get ready for an assigned stakeout. 
thus closing this chapter. Bizarre Love Triangle. The Silver Case. So, this chapter does a much better job at enveloping you into the world of the Silver Case. It properly introduces the main characters after doing away with the fodder, and we get a much deeper look into how the heinous crimes unit work on a job, rather than have an emergency situation whiz by one of their heads. I also like how it's got a couple of twists that are typically more appropriate as third act surprises, but being teased of this threatening Kamui character as soon as the game's introduction movie and then coming to terms that he's the most helpless and least dangerous character of all? Not only that, but Kamui seems to be doing the opposite of a serial killer. He's not taking away the lives of others, he's giving new life. While that isn't really a virtue in of itself in my opinion, the fact that it's a literal opposite of a serial killer's habits, I think was intentional. Ayame murdered a number of women because they were mothering some of Kamui's children. So speaking on what causes people to commit crimes, hers can be considered a crime of passion. Speaking more on said passion, let's look at the song they closed the transmitter chapter with, Bizarre Love Triangle by New Order. And it's safe to say this chapter had at least one of those. It seems to be about someone engaged in two romantic relationships, much like the multiple women after Kamui's affection. Whether or not one of these parties aren't reciprocating said love or romance, that's what it is. There's no sense in telling me the wisdom of the fool won't set you free, but that's the way that it goes and it's what nobody knows. Well, every day my confusion grows. This could connect to the chapter, considering the actual nature of Kamui's crimes and perhaps even telling you that you're only finding it more confusing because you're overthinking what the truth may be. At least, that's how I see it. This and the rest of the lyrics are centered around a love triangle that couldn't possibly work out for any of the parties involved, much like the one between Ayame, Kamui, and his lovers. It's as bizarre as a love triangle can get. The song also emphasizes a person who is unable to kill their past, which I think is important as well. This is a story about a kid named Koichi looking for his friend Hikaru, who's gone missing. None of the adults will tell him what's going on, but he's determined to find out the truth. He reminisces about meeting Hikaru for the first time. Koichi showed him around town, well, as much as a little kid can, and they quickly became best friends. The title card shows up and also serves as a giveaway of Hikaru's unfortunate fate. This is Spectrum. The next scene has Sumio and Tetsu on their stakeout. Throughout this chapter, it keeps cutting back to them suffering from a boring task, but let's summarize it all here. Sumio, our younger detective, is still smitten over Ayame. Tetsu doesn't take kindly to these feelings. With this being their priority job, the main case itself needs to be handled by the rest of HCU. That includes Blakira, who is officially registered as a part-time dick. Tetsu later laments an unfortunate horse race he bet on. The man lost 50,000 yen. That was like over 500 bucks back then. But these days, it's more like a price for a cup of coffee here. After some squabbling, Nakatagawa ends up lending him the cheddar. Either way, the two are losing their minds over this stakeout. Regarding their shit task, Sumio states it can't be helped. And this sets something off in Tetsu. Says that a real detective would never say that and that it's a sign of giving up and that's when the criminals win. Tetsu even threatens to kill him if he catches him saying that ever again. And this is about all they accomplish in this chapter. Back to the main case of Spectrum, Hachisuka comes a knocking and asks you to join her for an investigation, which is in a particular apartment complex. A man named Kawabata greets you in the back area. He explains the situation that they found a body that fell multiple stories down from the apartment ledge on the fifth floor. Cops are already on the scene and Morikawa shows up to investigate as well. Hachisuka gives us more details on the case, possible suicide, and the body was identified as a resident named Hiruma who lived in the third floor of this apartment. And here's where some people get a little stuck since Morikawa says you can go, but this faceless cop says you can't. D which one is it? <laughs> Jesus Christ, stop yelling at me! <laughs> Oh, that's where the voice text came from. 
I can only assume Koichi saw the detective work going on below and decided to shout for help. Back in the HCU, Morikawa is bickering at Nakatagawa who is able to deny compliance, seeing as how he isn't technically part of their team, working for Central. Hachisuka seems ruffled about working with Morikawa and goes to Kotobuki demanding a reassignment, but he's only willing to show her the door. She backs down as she and Morikawa start spatting off. Nakatagawa butts in, saying her line of work is becoming archaic in the world of heinous crimes, profiling, forensics, etc. He also tells Morikawa to keep the romance out of the workplace. There's also a, a bit of an implication here. And for those that might not know, the Japanese text read younger girls as Lolicon. I really like these office squabbles. They're fun to follow. Kotobuki decrees you a special agent. Wow, I didn't have to say a single word to get such a sweet gig. He says you're almost built like a criminal. These guys are basically cops, so that makes sense. <laughs> Oh, what's that? Our first Fire Pro Wrestling reference in a Suda 51 game? Fuck yeah, let's go! Firebird So now you're partnered up with Morikawa to investigate the death in the apartment, which he now thinks could have been a homicide. You're also told to keep tabs on the kid, and the first thing Morikawa does with you as his partner? Ditch your ass immediately. What a fucking prick. You're really just gonna leave my mute ass here to investigate by myself? Probably so you can go chase some bitch in forensics? Call a cab? How? I can't fucking talk. The least you could do is come pick me up later. Call a cab? I'm gonna call you a fucking ambulance after I investigate how badly I can beat you senseless. I faced Kamui in the forest by myself. I watched and or heard my partners die miserable deaths. I ain't afraid of your Howard Stern looking ass, you stupid fu- Oh yeah, let's go see that kid. Koichi wants you to find Hikaru and states how everyone is just ignoring his disappearance like it's a plot the community is in on. He tells you about how his mom is constantly working to make ends meet, so he's usually alone, but he was fine since he got to hang out with Hikaru a lot. He was never entirely alone, both of them were raised by single moms. Through their loneliness, Koichi and Hikaru became close friends. You promise to see Koichi again, while also being visited by a lingering spirit. The next day, you find a note that leads you to the secret base in the parking lot Koichi and Hikaru built. Koichi gets his detective hat on, describing to you all the suspects, which are just kids that were mean to him and or Hikaru. Honestly, this debriefing turns into a childish ramble, which makes sense, he's just a kid. Did anyone else just ramble stupid, possibly made up stories to their parents when they were kids? I did that a lot. I probably made grocery trips really annoying for my mom. Huh. Maybe that's why I make these videos. The point is, the writing is very realistic. You're later assigned to speak with as many tenants of the apartment as you can, but as you're on your way there with Morikawa, he notices an off-duty Chizuru driving by and decides to harass her, as one would expect. Although, something is definitely going on between them. She says she's just a doll, which is peculiar. Morikawa tells you to take off without him, so I got the car. Now I get to leave his ass in the dust. Not so satisfying if he's just telling me to do that. Observing the parking lot, a ghastly figure surprises you while shouting their devotion to protect Koichi. Speak of the devil, he's calling from you from his fourth floor apartment. Some players might get the bright idea to go straight to Koichi, but guess what, dumbass? The game won't allow it. Not until you've questioned every resident that's willing to answer their door. Speaking to various civilians, you get to hear different takes on the event. Some say it was suicide, other state it's going to mess up property values, all kinds of nonsense. But more importantly, do something about all the illegal parking out front. His apartment was <laughs> kind of dark and smelled like cigarettes. He lived in this building by himself, right? And the parking lot's in the back? Yeah, so that's about it. <laughs> Wait, what? He closed it like mid-sentence. That's about he it. Was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but you know, that guy on the second floor? He looks kind of sketchy, but he's actually a good guy. Look into him and I'm sure you'll see. What? Blockbuster? Did Japan have blockbusters? Oh, hey, what do you know? The economy is bad all over. I envy you guys. It's not like you have to worry about going bankrupt. Now this is the time to spend. Use up all the company's budget. Do whatever you want, you know? Because trouble for everyone else and then let another department wipe your ass for you. <laughs> I like this guy. 
He even says he sees Hikaru's ghost sometimes. Hey, me too! And thinks said ghost killed Hiruma. You even get to chat with Tokyo, who actually recognizes you for a second. He won't really talk to you though, likely collecting information himself and- Holy shit, I got the achievement! Sweet! <laughs> this one, I swear, is so buggy. I would try to get it every time I got to this part. I don't know, maybe I just kept messing it up. Now I'm a real silver case gamer! Uh, anyway, it's the superintendent that tells you straight up what happened to Hikaru. The kid had a weak heart and suddenly died one day. I'm not sure how aware the HCU members were of this fact, but it's certainly the first confirmation players got without tiptoeing around the matter. Finally, after talking to everyone, you go up to Koichi's apartment. He reminisces about a time with Hikaru and visiting a haunted house. He also recalls seeing someone from the apartment complex watching him, but cuts things short, asking you to leave. The next day at HCU, Morikawa deduces that you need to make Koichi see the truth. No more beating around the bush. He has to know everything. But before that, you're in for a thrill ride! The 100 question kumite! Oh shit, I only got 10 seconds per question? How does the scoring work? How will I know if I'm even doing well? Alright, I've got no choice but to do this! Bust out all your brain cells storing mostly worthless knowledge. Here we go! Huh? I, I passed? Hell yeah, I'm a genius! Oh, oh, none of the answers mattered? Really? Uh... Yay? James Mountain talked a little bit about translating the 100 question kumite and how he suggested replacing a handful of the questions with more western-oriented references. The one thing that we did have a lot of back and forth with that took a lot of tweaking and adjustments with Suda and Grasshopper's guidance was Shakumon Kumite, the 100 question quiz, I guess. There was a lot of stuff in there that I'm like, okay, I, I could translate this into English, but nobody's going to know what the fuck I'm talking about, you know? Like stuff about TV shows or like pro wrestlers from Japan from like the, the early 80s or something like that. You probably notice that there's a lot of stuff in that part that has to do with like references to like the Simpsons or like Back to the Future and just really, you know, Western centric stuff. There actually was a lot of really Western stuff included in the original text. The majority of it was localized pretty straightforwardly, but there was a lot of things that I was like, okay, there's no way that a Westerner who doesn't speak Japanese, who's never lived in Japan, who isn't familiar with like Japanese pop culture 20 years ago, there's no way they're going to get this. So I'm just going to go ahead and totally change it to something completely different. You know, instead of like a question about like some early 80s Japanese pro wrestler or something like that, or some manga or something, I change it to a question about like a Led Zeppelin song, something that I was personally into. It didn't include an explanation for why I changed this to this. There was a lot of back and forth with, with that stuff, with uh, Suda himself and with Grasshopper saying, okay, well, this one and this one this one are okay but as far as this one and this one go Sudo would tell me you know i don't really have any personal connection to this specific ip or i don't i'm not into jefferson airplane or whatever the hell it was that i included you know maybe tweak it so that it's uh instead of having just something completely unrelated change that like early 80s like manga or that early 80s japanese pro wrestler to like something to be more familiar to to, to westerners so that was probably the part of the game. In fact, I'd say that was probably the only part of the game where I really had any specific feedback and like guidelines and rules about how to go about the localization. Death Grips, and what, what is the name of the famous sun goddess in the Shinto religion? Oh, Amaterasu. Wow, okay. <laughs> Bronze, which of the following people is not a leader of the Yalta Conference during World War II? Um, Truman. Sonic Kick, and what year was 2001 A Space Odyssey, the Stanley Kubrick directed film based on Arthur C. Clarke novel released? See, see, 1987. <laughs> Death Curse, what is the third branch of the United States government apart from the judicial and legislative branches? Oh, executive. Dominican, right. I'm glad that Suda didn't just let James add whatever he wanted and instead emphasize how it needs to be related to things he likes as well. So you're off to meet with Koichi one more time. Our dear little soul is faced with the truth as he finally recalls that fateful day including Hikaru's last moments, dying of a heart attack as they were being chased by Hiruma. He breaks down as his mind has nowhere left to run. The rest of the HCU are discussing the case of Hiruma. Morikawa rationalizes that the man had problems with his autonomic nerves. This nervous system can be triggered through chronic stress and cause disorders. Morikawa thinks the guy saw Koichi and Hikaru having a good time and decided enough was enough. 
Damn, dude just hated kids, I guess. Getting chased down by a grown adult proved too much for Hikaru, dying of a heart attack mid-chase. Everyone there comes to terms that they lost the miracle of a child that day. Two innocent souls forever changed from the truth of death. Morikawa hopes Koichi eventually sees happier days. While he thinks it was a suicide, it's in the placebo chapter where we learn Koichi admitted to his guilt of killing Hiruma in a letter. I guess take your mileage on believing a kid's words, but the characters in Placebo investigated the case much deeper than Morikawa did, as far as I can tell. Chizuru has a little talk with you, apologizing for her behavior, slyly ending her spiel with the typical excuse men try to use when women are acting quote-unquote out of line. We're then eased into the sounds of an image of a tree frog. Love will tear us apart. So, what was this chapter about? I think some of this story serves as an analog for Suda's own childhood. I mean, come on, Koichi, Goichi. Something he shares with this kid is that Suda never really knew his father, who abandoned his family very early in his life, leaving his mother to work full time in order to continue supporting him on her own. I have almost no memory of my father. For much of my childhood, I lived alone with my mother. I've only seen my father two or three times since their divorce. The day I have absolutely no contact with him, my mother began proceedings for a change in identity after the divorce. This is how I became Goichi Suda. Until I was seven, my name was Goichi Kobayashi. Imagine that, we almost had Koba 51 instead. Doesn't look nor sound as cool to me. So, I believe part of Spectrum was Suda expressing how alone he felt as a kid, seeing as how his single mother had to work multiple jobs in order to keep a roof above their heads, which meant he spent a lot of his time alone, possibly having a tough time making friends. Speaking more on how autobiographical this chapter potentially is, the frog at the end makes me think of Suda's childhood as well. When he was really young, he had a questionable habit of pulling frogs' legs off for fun, as an adult, he says he doesn't know why he did it as a kid, and he can't even think about hurting them now. Flash forward to him making a mobile game called Frog Minutes. I like to think he designed and released that game as a form of repentance for what he did as a child to those poor little froggies, making a quirky little game where the player easily learned about various frog species. And for what it's worth, all proceeds went towards the earthquake relief fund that was going on in Japan back in 2011. Look at that! We finally mentioned Frog Minutes in a video, everyone! Frog up! <laughs> I think this chapter is also about the fragile approach people sometimes take regarding death in the presence of a child. I can't recall when I learned what an individual's death meant, but I believe I was a bit older than this Koichi kid, so I understand his family's and neighbor's approach, especially considering this wasn't just anyone, but his best friend passing away, also at a young age. Perhaps you can see Koichi as a different kind of criminal, the one that didn't really know what he was doing, leading a man to fall to his death during a fit of heartbroken rage. Now let's talk about the song connected to Spectrum, Love Will Tear Us Apart by Joy Division. While the most direct interpretation of these lyrics are related to the lead singer's crumbling love life, broad interpretations infer how tenuous the nature of all relationships are. Love is what makes a relationship so important and also what can make it so devastating when it ends. And not just a relationship between partners either, but family, friends, etc. The connection you develop deeply with someone. Perhaps Koichi loved Hikaru, as much as he could comprehend at least. He obviously cared about him a lot. They made each other feel like they weren't alone in this world, that they mattered. Koichi's mind couldn't understand what it meant to lose that love, to lose his best friend. So Koichi tried running away from the matter, mentally speaking. The love Koichi had for Hikaru is what made his tragic death so devastating for him. That love is what tore Koichi apart, from within. This chapter opens up with an animation of a dark, unwelcoming industrial factory. The heavy steam and smoke blowing at your face as these loud, clanky gears are turning, showing us the title, Parade. There is nothing wrong with your television set, as nearly the entirety of this chapter is presented in black and white. You see these flashes of what you can only presume are memories from someone, or possibly a nightmare, a princess and three young boys. What is this story about? 
black clouds, a chimera emerging. This is the tale of a little girl and a local tragedy. It's July 11th, Sumio and Tetsu are still on the stakeout. Sumio starts telling Tetsu about a little fairy tale. He says it's a story from his own town and it's about a princess and the serpent that invaded her land. A band of heroes went to fight the serpent and save the princess. So they did. Quite the simple story, but that's Sumio's point. Like a lot of old fairy tales, this story has its details mixed up or replaced in order to be more palatable, leaving out key bits like how the princess was dead before the heroes could recover her, or the serpent wasn't really a serpent, but a man. The idea of spinning a fairy tale in order to make it more palatable is as old as time, really. Sumio also says something interesting here. Fairy tales are crimes. The unrealistic fantasy that happens in real life is crime. I like to think he means this in a way to explain some crimes and the motive behind them just don't make sense to the world outside of the committer. He then asks Tetsu what he would do if he came across those heroes that got revenge on the Serpent Man. Tetsu says it's still crime, even if it is an act of pure revenge. Sounds like he would still take them under if he could, before drifting off to sleep. Sumio then asks you to search the perimeter of the house they're stalking. Nothing to report on, but as soon as you complete circling the house, KABOOM! The Yukimura Mansion centered for this stakeout up in smoke. July 12th, the next day, Sakaguchi, advisor of Central HQ, conducts a meeting over what happened last night. He explains that this case started about two months ago, during Spectrum, when a note was sent to the Yukimura Zaibatsu Corporation's main building, The Monkey Laughs. According to him, only the chairman of Yukimura understood this message. It was his home we were stalking, by the way. So, while nobody seemed to be in the mansion, the chairman has been missing ever since the explosion. He also notes how the Yukimura company holds a great influence on Japan's economy, an important little detail. So, now this case is top priority for the entire police force of the 24 wards. After the announcement, you meet a man named Kosaka who works for Central, like Nakatagawa. He presents a videotape that was sent in, possibly by the kidnapper. Chairman Yukimura is shown bound and gagged, but alive. Tetsu thinks there's much more to this case, that this isn't just some ransom for money. Next scene has you, Tetsu, and Sumio at the Yukimura Zaibatsu building, or Snow Tower. As you all discuss matters in said building, Kosaka shows us some ghouls dwelling in the top floor. Executives of Yukimura arguing who will step up as the new chairman, expecting the death of Yukimura like a bunch of vultures. Do the numbers decide? Well, what the hell else do we have to work with? Yeah, well, you consider each respective department. Yeah. <laughs> You're just here for the chairman's amusement, right? <laughs> well, obviously, so are you. What the hell are you talking about? Kosaka and Tetsu talk about methods of investigation and the nature of how it needs to evolve as crime continues to evolve. Central has the whole area locked down, but Tetsu thinks the real threat isn't anywhere near Snow Tower. July 19th, we've got Tetsu and Sumio inside the apartment of one of the suspects, only to find a hanged body. Three days later, we're back at HCU and the forensics concluded the body was Hanao Hiseki, the one that bombed the mansion. Their only lead committed suicide. No time to grieve as they received another tape. Kosaka thinks it's a warning that someone is going to die very soon. Man, this is starting to feel like a college film all of a sudden. The next day, in forensics, Sumio shows us some of his investigation skills, finding a watermark on the latest ransom tape. Through this, they find a secret message that reads July 26th and 600 billion yen diamond, their latest demand. That's just a few days away. Hey, isn't it weird that Sumio knew to look for that? It's July 25th. Tetsu and the folks at Central are discussing how they can come up with the money, assuredly a large enough number to blow off the legs of any corporation. Well, except Disney, I guess. And Apple. And Microsoft. And Sony. And Tencent. And Saudi Arabia. Now it's July 26th, the big day. We're instructed to have someone from HCU come with the requested diamond, only with a few key items on hand. 
but not just anyone from HCU, specifically you! Big Dick! Uh, Blakira. Sumio comes along to back you up outside the perimeter. Jesus Christ, calm the fuck down! You're dropping off a diamond, not driving Prince Diana down Ponte Lalma. Once you get to the drop-off point, you're cut from all the other communications. It's just you and the culprit. After he messes with you for a bit, you get a hint that he's waiting for you on the tall smokestack nearby. A long cable is shot across, and you pass on the case with the diamond. As he receives it, he transmits three little words. Kill the past. He undoes his face mask, revealing a stitched up mouth, and jumps into the smokestack, taking his own life and destroying the 600 billion yen diamond. Six, North Avenue, Shortly after this happens, firemen and investigators come to the scene to search for Chairman Yukimura. He's found incapacitated, but alive. The next day at the HCU, Yukimura was retrieved, but his company just lost 600 billion yen. It's explained that there was a request to use public funds to purchase said diamond, but it was rejected. Thank God. So the entirety of that was paid through Yukimura's estate, which led to the financial ruin of the company. No doubt that was the culprit's real objective the entire time. Jumping in the smokestack also left no traces of his body, meaning they couldn't even identify who that man was. Kosaka from Central brings Tetsu up on the matter while expressing diminishing morale for how his own team has been handling this situation. After this botched mission, I don't blame him. He also expresses some admiration for how the HCU members tend to dispose of the criminals and attempt to cover up whatever incidents they're handling. For what it's worth, this crime they've been following has only seen the culprits themselves facing early deaths. Nobody he considers innocent, but also that the message these criminals are trying to send is something that the public won't take lightly. Perhaps Kosaka is afraid it would radicalize people? Something I'm sure none of these cops really want. Tetsu thinks he should just forget about all that and only focus on stopping the crime and investigate. To not sweat what he considers the small stuff, something Kosaka will keep to his chest for years to come. After that, we see Sumio outside with Chairman Yukimura. Although, no words that we know of are exchanged. July 31st at HCU, Nakaragawa states that the Yukimura Zaibatsu is holding an emergency board meeting. You know it's an emergency if it's on a Saturday. We go to Snow Tower as the meeting commences and see these executive ghouls again, telling the chairman they're glad he's safe, but keeping in how they actually feel. Yukimura expresses some gratitude, but it's about as fake as these ghouls' relief, as he then triggers an explosion that destroys the snow tower, killing everyone, including himself, inside of it. August 1st at HCU, they're talking about the incident. Yukimura as a company has been completely liquidated. Hachisuka stating that this was likely all part of that unnamed culprit's plan. Morikawa notes that only the executives died, as it was not a regular workday, thus no lower class employees were harmed. Later that day, you and Tetsu head to the Yukimura warehouse to find some information on him. Inside this warehouse, we learn that Yukimura was essentially an urban redevelopment company. Huh. This is all sounding a bit familiar, isn't it? Yeah. Bunch of losers. Once you get in the document storage room, you and Tetsu get into some reading, although there's redacted information throughout. We go through nine different documents, so let's go over them and tell the story in order. In July of 1970, Yukimura Zaibatsu established factory construction in a town known as Mikumo Village. 
The company was granted permission after currying the favor of a political figure in charge of the area. Investigations over the deal and construction were being constantly disrupted. November 1975, there's protests against the construction of the building and its Mukimo 77 project. They tried taking this matter to the Supreme Court, but their appeals have been denied, all while construction plans continue to reach legal approval. People related to filing these rejected appeals would end up missing. May 1977, an investigator digs up old info, like how the Yukimura family bought land that was once owned by an old family bloodline and also a crime scene. Also, it's being discovered that the factory is contaminating Mikumo Village's river, their main source for water, with their waste. February 1979, the water inspections for Mikumo Village are taking an uncommon amount of time to complete and likely manipulated as it was approved for consumption. Conflicts are becoming more and more rampant between residents and Yukimura workers. More tests were done by a private group who did find the water was heavily contaminated, tested positive for materials similar to hydrochloric acid. According to the report, consuming this water can cause long-term damage to the nervous system, dizziness, and even hallucinations. August 1979, the body of Riru Yukimura was found, a daughter of said family. Autopsy suggested she was beaten and violated by multiple people and that she was killed during one of the bigger parade protest demonstrations, a series of events that only grew more violent at each demonstration. According to Tokyo's research, there were also reports of three boys getting mutilated but left alive. A month later, the main perpetrator of Riru's murder surrendered. October 1979, investigators found evidence that the official water quality reports were faked with the person behind the report put under arrest. After going through all the documents, a secret hatch opens. It contains the ninth document from November 4th, 1979. The end of the story. The body of the representative trying to appeal that Mikomo 77 factory was discovered and he was in talk with the boys in order to reveal the truth of Mikumo 77 and Yukimura to everyone. It goes into detail that said boys were mutilated, but a lot of the redacted information makes it hard to comprehend. Two of the boys' names ended with Ki, and their leader was Su O I. Sumio Kodai. We see visuals of protesters from long ago. Tatsu makes an interesting statement. That's when he makes all the connections, realizing Sumio was behind the entire crime. Yeah, you thought this was going to be a clear-cut story of coppers stopping some crimes, huh? Just shoot some psychos in the face and everything ends all hunky-dory. Too bad, idiot. This is the real world. In the late 90s, the cops are criminals. The president is getting his dick sucked while corporations are sucking your own life essence as capitalism continues to go haywire. Southeast Asia is hit with a financial crisis and Mario Party came out, tearing apart friendships and palms across the globe. Things aren't so cut and dry like your palms palms are now, they never were. I should have never started this video. A seasoned officer in the heinous crimes unit is the mastermind behind this trail of anti-capitalist destruction. August 2nd, we head by helicopter with Sumio and Tetsu to see that old Mikumo 77 village. All the color of the world fades back in. Tetsu is still shown in black and white. We see the spirit of Riru Yukimura. This ghost town gets obliterated and her spirit disappears, finally being put to rest. Yeah. 
Tetsu asks Sumio why he went this far. And like Hiseki, like the culprit that jumped in the smokestack, Sumio states it was to kill the past. He says Mikumo is where all of his past lies, and with the help of his now deceased friends, he's killing his own past with this crime. We're treated to a flashback of Sumio first meeting Tetsu as they reminisce, the last memory they share as Tetsu puts him under arrest. Regret. The silver case. So, Parade is important in a lot of ways. First and foremost, I saw it as a story of the HCU and supporting organizations outright failing their objective in every which way. And how could they have succeeded? Sumio was their saboteur from the inside. But looking at all this, can you morally root for the HCU in this case? The terrorists, if you want to call them that, made every effort not to harm any innocent people in their mission. They only had their sights set on Yukimura Zaibatsu, a corporation that showed time after time they did not care for the well-being of others, only intending to cause more harm in their society while prioritizing their bottom line. It might be laid on a little thick, but hey, Suda wanted to get his point across. These executives were parasites, and the Snow Tower housed them. Just like Mikumo 77, they were only going to cause more harm to folks while reaping any profits they could get in their urban redevelopment projects. This also serves as part of Suda's concerns regarding housing projects, mass apartment complexes, and the mutations of regular suburban living. These concerns first appeared in Moonlight Syndrome, and we see this nightmare evolve further in the 25th Ward. But I'm getting ahead of myself and behind myself. These kinds of aspects of modernizations all stem from capitalism, and this is what I mean when I say time and again that Suda likes providing some anti-capitalist commentary in his games. And any ape brains ready to comment, but he sells video games on the market, he can't be anti-capitalist, you really just don't get it, and need to stop considering the idea to be all-encompassing to all forms of creating and selling goods or providing services. It's possible to sell something like a video game while holding up anti-capitalist beliefs and using said medium to express that. From what I can tell, Suda is using this platform to challenge certain capitalistic aspects that began forming around the mid-90s and even before, and wants to bring more awareness to it. While the core concept of making and selling product can be considered an aspect of capitalism, he's not exploiting slaves to mine diamonds or buying a social media platform for billions of dollars in order to pretend he has friends. I'm not really qualified to make the argument of ethical consumption in a world of capitalism, but I think it's fair to say that this is not as bad as what the biggest corporations do and what they violate in order to take those dollars. Or yen. I'd talk more about this aspect of urban redevelopment and capitalism, but I think it's much more appropriate to save the entire conversation for when I analyze the 25th Ward, a game where this future Suda had concerns for becomes a reality. Well, in this game's fictional world. Of course, there's also the tragedy of Riru to talk about, and the Mikumo 77. This aspect might have possibly been based on a real-life incident in Japan that occurred back in the 50s known as Minamata, where the industrial factory known as Chizo poured contaminated liquids into a river that ended up poisoning the water supply of a nearby town, causing irreparable damage and disorders to their bodies and even fetuses. This led to large protests against the factory and demand not just for reparations, but for a change in regulations. Hundreds of people even broke into the Chizo factory, doing what they could for their voices to be heard, and perhaps Perhaps their demands to be met. Sadly, these cases wouldn't even be settled until the mid-2000s in the form of monetary compensations. Chizo wasn't the only case like this in Japan, but at this point I'd rather direct you towards a video by Macrophones you can watch after all this. While he talks about the game as a whole, he gives great focus on this chapter and how it relates to the Chizo incident, as well as other events that occurred in Japan. He also goes into a lot of other aspects that I don't, such as Tetsugoro Kusabi's character and viewpoint. I think a good way to describe Macrophones' video is that he provides a much more literary perspective than I could. And by that I mean he reads a lot more books than I do. A little warning for people that didn't play all of Suda's directed games, he does spoil some future titles as well in the video. Sumio and his friends achieve their goal, to avenge Riru Yukimura, the little girl they loved, 
the last shred of innocence left in that village that was violated and killed thanks to the corporation her heartless family built. The remains of her unfettered soul were put to rest at the destruction of the Mikumo village, while the remaining Mikumo boy likely hopes this can start a change in Japan for the better, as anybody does when trying to spread awareness of what they feel needs to change for a better society. During Tokyo's research, he makes the connections between Hiseki, the blind bomber, Fuyuki, the hushed hopper, and Sumio, the deaf detective, being mutilated in ways that represent the three wise monkeys. This explains the early note that was sent to Yukimura that simply read, The Monkey Laughs. See no evil, Hiseki. Hear no evil, Sumio. And speak no evil, Fuyuki. Typically, the symbolism of these monkeys are about avoiding immoral actions upon others or yourself. They also tend to represent virtuous conduct, doing things for the greater good. If they fight for anything, it's the ethical behavior of others so they can contribute to a harmonious society. In a way, this can describe the Mikumo boys pretty well, as they feel they are doing exactly that by destroying capitalistic corporations looking to further destroy more human lives while reaping the profits. I also like how the majority of the story was shown in black and white, and it isn't until all is revealed that characters like Sumio begin to be presented in full color once again. Almost like he's freeing a part of himself that he's kept bottled up this whole time. He won't feel complete until he has avenged Riru, the girl he loved 20 years ago. I have another, perhaps less reliable, interpretation to this as well. As a boy raised in the American public school system, I can cite The Giver, a 1993 young adult novel by Lois Lowry that a lot of people probably had to read for school at some point, just like me. I think I was 12 or 13, but that general story definitely stuck with me. Now, of course, I can't say with confidence that Suda took any inspiration from the novel. While it gained critical acclaim shortly after release, I'm not sure how quickly it was translated for Japanese readers. I guess there's a bit of a window of opportunity where a Westaboo like Suda could have read this book, say if it was released within a year or so before the Silver Case. Again though, this seems unlikely, so I'm just spitballing here. Anyway, the book is about a boy named Jonas living in a community that is absent of color. This led to a large community of absolute order or conformity. It's through the holder of memories, or the giver, to help Jonas see color and begin to understand the horrible world he lives in, the one with no color, no individuality, no real life. And before we begin to consider how much this plays into Suda's focus on individualism in his future titles, it's also worth stating that one of the purest definitions of punk rock was being non-conformist. And if Grasshopper had any phrase this early on, it was, let's punk, a rejection of mainstream culture. To see color is to see truth, unfiltered. And this is what Sumio and his friends did for the 24 Awards. The truth of Mikumo, the truth of the Yukimura Company, the truth of this crime. Because, like Sumio said earlier, crime is a form of fantasy or a fairy tale. And behind that fairy tale is the real story, the absolute truth. The Mikumo boys weren't just committing crimes, they were revealing the truth to everyone around them. What's that old phrase? Showing your true colors? Eh? I like to think Tetsu still being black and white signifies that he hasn't revealed his whole hand, not like Sumio did just now. There's more secrets behind his face that he isn't ready to show. This chapter is also the first time we see a character utter that infamous phrase, kill the past, and it's treated as a pretty significant moment. It is first said, or transmitted I guess, by Fuyuki, a character we barely even learn anything about, but it definitely encapsulated him and his story. As I've said before, I think kill the past means facing your past and finally letting it all go or stopping its grip on your reality. For the better of yourself or those around you, you cannot let the past weigh you down or hold you back. Was Fuyuki killing his past? Or Riru's past? Or the chairman's past? In my opinion, all of the above. Riru's spirit couldn't rest because her own family never faced the consequences for their actions, for their heartlessness, abandoning their daughter to the angry mob they poisoned. So Fuyuki accepted this objective to help the soul of a girl he loved finally rest. Destroying himself with the diamond also led to Chairman Yukimura taking responsibility and killing his past. Hiseki also helped kill this past by destroying the Yukimura mansion before taking his own life. Sumio, 
attempted to kill his past, leaving everything revealed so he can no longer hide who he is while also being the brains of this operation. I don't think it's a stretch to say this mission was the sole reason he conned his way into the police force. The phrase, kill the past, will come up later, and we'll talk more about it after analyzing the rest of the story. Let's also look at the New Order song referenced at the end of the chapter, Regret. From what I can tell, it's about someone who wants a nice, calm, simple way of life. A lifestyle that'll help them forget their past and the trauma that haunts them. It ends with this line, just wait till tomorrow, I guess that's what they all say, just before they fall apart. It makes me think of Sumio reflecting on what he and the rest of the Mikumo boys committed. That it's foolish to think the state of things will get better now that they've accomplished this, but things will only fall apart more and more as society continues. Kind of a downer, but an unfortunate truth for most cases. The title of the song also got me thinking, what is there to be regretful about? I then looked at the Mikumo boys and what they committed. Hiseki destroyed the abode of Yukimura, and then himself. Fuyuki destroyed the financial gain of Yukimura, and then himself. Their ringleader, the one that made this all possible, Sumio destroyed the past that was the Mikumo village, but not himself. I think Sumio planned to take his own life with that explosion, and this was further theorized in the placebo portion. Hiseki likely rigged the village to explode like he did the Yukimura mansion and office building, and I think Sumio planned to be in the village when the explosion occurred, but Tetsu putting him under arrest stopped that from happening. Side note, I actually want to think about this a little more. Was Tetsu apprehending Sumio simply to make a criminal serve time? Or does he care that deeply for Sumio that he doesn't want him to die? Regardless, perhaps Sumio feels regret for not joining his brothers, the rest of the Mikumo boys, in the afterlife, now sealed with a fate of further suffering and inner degradation. Perhaps with this failed last step, he knew his past was not truly dead. The chapter opens up with online chat room logs. Seems like a number of internet Melvins arguing about who's the bigger Melvin. It was the late 90s, this is all most people could do online. The username Old Man gets in and starts spamming this phrase, Believe in the net. This is Kamui Drome. August 21st, Blakir is happy in his apartment as he receives an email from Tokyo talking about a case concerning some online gooners and a lead which is a club called Ronnie Rockets. Later that evening, we see a man-child named Tomo in his computer being an asshole to his mom, ignoring her, and then talking shit about her anonymously online. This leads to some chat room discussion about the deterioration of parenthood and family life due to modernizations in society. Uh, I think. As he starts up a program to explore the seedier part of the internet, a dark web of sorts, Tomo gains access to a site called KamuiNet. It shows Kamui's criminal records, a string of assassinations committed in 1975 that include a mayor, a CEO of a corrupt recycling corporation, a member of the Kanto Ministry of Justice, a bunch of vile high school students, a cultist. Basically, he's been accused of killing various terrible people. Kamui gained notoriety in 1979 when he was only 20 years old, once the Silver Case came into play involving members of the NGO parties and a TRO slash COO. Fuck involving members of the NGO parties and a TRO slash CCO chairman was killed. Yeah, remember these organizations? No? <laughs> that's, that's cool. This assassination occurred as a new mayor's election victory was being disputed. Nobody was found connected to Kamui's crimes. This site has nicknamed him Angel of Absolute Zero. It also notes that a lot of his victims were people that essentially got away with their crimes without being properly tried. He was like a vigilante, taking the law into his own hands, and even the site bears the phrase, kill the past. August 22nd, Nakata Gawain HCU is talking about the progress of network crime, as well as an increase of missing person reports. He thinks these are linked, seeing the rise of seedier websites. They also discuss just how easily these kinds of unlawful groups function and how they access information ripe for the picking. He begins to tell them about a girl who was on the internet a lot and liked making friends online. She became obsessed with being online and let it influence what she found fulfilling in life, her beauty. 
I'm not entirely sure what to make of this story, but I'll take a shot. It seems she met up with some online friends at a club, did some hard ass drugs, and was told the world will change in a week. So a week passes and she finds the Dark Angel Black Sight Network. After that, according to Nakaragawa, she disappeared. Another missing person case, one that he was requested to investigate. Morikawa and Hachisuka don't feel like taking it on, so Blakira is on the case. And all you've got as a lead, to a lead, is this flyer. You head to the Ronnie Rockets nightclub to investigate. You're surrounded by people. Use your imagination. These folks are not exactly pleasant. You show off the flyer, and this skeevy looking guy approaches you, acting suspicious as hell. Nobody said neck crime, bro. Nobody's accusing you of anything. Blakira is a mute, you dingus. Anyway, he points you in the right direction. At the perfect time to call Boss Baby, you head into the office to see Nakaragawa is still there. He provides help to get to this new website lead. August 23rd, you receive a notification on your computer stating your entry to the underground site will be either approved or denied in a week. Sound familiar? This actually happens a lot throughout this chapter as most of Blakira's escapades involve him sitting in front of a computer. All the while, Tokyo is squabbling with other internet assholes throughout most of this chapter himself. They're just like me! Later in the day, Tomo is on Kamui Net, getting into stupid arguments with random jerk-offs on the internet, as we all did on our Sonic fansite forums of choice in the early 2000s. Apparently, Tomo here has been pushing these anons too far, and they dox him at rapid pace. August 24th, Nakaragawa, Morikawa, and Hachisuka are checking out an upcoming secret livestream of Sayaka Bayan, a famous J-pop idol. Dude spent 300k yen of the HCU's money just to get a glimpse at some idle panties. I could only guess they were doing this to attempt tracing the source of the feed as they're invading someone's privacy. The livestream starts and it's just Sayaka chilling in her apartment. Ah, I see Tarantino's in the chat. Nothing explicit is really shown, this isn't that kind of game. The feed cuts off, and the next shot shows a girl jumping off a rooftop to her death. It's August 25th, and Sayaka Bayan's suicide is all over the news. Back at the HCU, they're talking about the incident, how Sayaka committed suicide because of the secret livestream exposing her private life, supposedly hosted by a sick fan club. According to Tokyo, they've been spying on her for about a week before she found out. Some real hacker shit going on. Although they never really get into how those cameras got in there. From what I can summarize, it's partially a commentary on how this growing internet culture was going to further put everyone under watch, under cameras, under spectators they didn't anticipate. You know, the whole laptop camera conspiracy, right? He also writes about what it means to insert yourself into this budding internet culture and how easily one can lose themselves in the midst of it. While the three HCU members are discussing the Sayaka Bayan incident, Hachisuka is pretty adamant about not feeling bad for the past idol, basically saying it comes with the territory. Whether or not she's right to think that is definitely up for debate. There's a conversation to be had about the ramifications of absolute fame, especially in the age of the internet. August 28th, a knock at Tomo's door. Could it be neutral? Tomo gets his bat ready to find out. And... Well, it is neutral. But she doesn't seem so ready to fight. Same for Tomo. That internet wall has now come down, and like two barking, sneering dogs, once there's no sense of barrier, they're just like, uh, now what? Like pretty much every single internet argument to this day, this is pretty much what it would amount to if the two bickering bullshitters actually meet face to face. Whoa, wait, I don't know about that part. Breaking through the facade of anonymous internet communication, these two found each other and allowed their masks to completely drop, showing their true faces and their real emotions. I think this conversation as a whole merely encapsulates how sensitive and downtrodden a lot of people are when all they like to do is sneer and bark through internet socials.
Later, a message from Old Man and Neutral. They proclaim themselves as gods and promise a revolution will happen on September 9th, 1999. Man, this is what one sex does to a motherfucker. They want to end this century with a bang and kill the past. Only then can one truly evolve a society. According to Tokyo's research, Old Man, or Tomo, even managed to destroy that old Kamui net that gave him nothing but disrespect and began building a new one for the new millennium. It's also noted that the mainstream media didn't take their message very seriously. Damn, sounds like Max Headroom caused more of a stir up than these online weirdos. It's September 9th and we're heading to see Chairman Kinjo. But you don't actually get to meet him, but instead this girl that apparently knows Nakatagawa? She talks about going to a different dimension. A dimension where... fractions and decimals exist. <laughs> what happens to the girl is a bit ambiguous, but I believe that was who you were assigned to search for to begin with. So... Good work. Back at HCU, they're reporting on the Kamui Net couple and how they're proclaiming the network crimes they plan to commit. But Kotobuki states they cannot try to interfere with them. There's strange reasoning behind it, but I chalk it up to the fact that the very concept of network crime or even internet criminals was still new to the HCU, so they cannot apprehend crimes that they do not understand. A transmission comes in, showing the countdown to the end of the century. Not literally, but the end of this society century. The next transformative development, a picture sharing application. A place where you view pictures that coincide with your social life. It is the true digitalization of real life. We lived on farms and then we lived in cities and now we're going to live on the internet. They're counting down to a new world order. As the method tank hits zero, the entire world gets hit with a power surge. Or at least the 24 wards, I'm not sure. Throughout this entire chapter, Tetsu is completely absent from this case. It's only in Placebo we see he's keeping tabs on this network crime crap, but is not actively investigating. Instead, he's frequently visiting an incarcerated Sumio. During their conversations, it seems Sumio here is trying to, at least partially, justify his actions. Hey, you won't hear any protests from me, but Tetsu feels differently. Crime is crime, and he won't let any of it slide if he can punish the perpetrator. And he thinks Sumio can't rationalize his actions while implying there's something wicked or evil inside of him. He and Tetsu then wax more philosophies, questioning what makes humanity truly unique and such. Sumio is also constantly inferring an impending event in the horizon, but Tetsu swears to remain forever the soldier. Sumio begins expressing a manifesto of sorts, saying he drove a wedge that is to kill his past while also avenging Riru, and that it's going to take the one and only witness to his manifesto to continue driving that wedge. Tetsu tries to play tough, but I think it's pretty clear that these words, along with Sumio's soul, are starting to get to him. Perhaps he's already thinking about that wedge, and how it will break through his spirit soon. Tetsu checks in on Sumio surprisingly often, and this is how much Sumio means to him as a person. Tetsu even catches him up on their current case. Sumio notes how the internet gooners may not be directly connected to Kamui, but see him as inspiration, the character they built him up to be. If they're jealous of anything, it's how Kamui has shaken up the 24 wards with his very presence, and they want to provide an even bigger impact. Something that'll change society even more. But anyway, the end of this conversation is what really kills me. Don't you get it, Sumio? Not really. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> Winding down this case in the batting center, Tetsu and Munakata are commenting on the temporary outage, mocking the Kamui group for thinking they did anything significant as the couple were likely arrested by those at Central. Munakata also infers that Kamui will return soon, and that he's part of this plan to get rid of what's left of FSO. Later, Tetsu is listening to the radio reporting on the outage. He begins struggling with his emotions, imagining Sumio right next to him and asking him for help. But he can't guide him. Tetsu has never felt this alone. We're left with an ominous image of Kamui. Perfect kiss. The silver case. I think a lot of this chapter's theme is the permanence of data and what spreads on the internet. Throughout Tokyo's research, he describes what this new form of life is like to him, how digital data doesn't rot, copies will be made, 
Whatever it is will keep spreading. Virtually nothing can be erased. The internet's not written in pencil mark, it's written in ink. They also talk about what it means to be a part of this internet world. How Sayaka Bayan herself became this digital idol of sorts. What does it mean when someone morphs themselves into this online personality, this internet celebrity? There's a point where you only really live on the internet, terminally online if you will. But once this lifestyle goes wrong, kiss it goodbye. Like Tokyo said, you get consumed out the ass and subsequently deleted. Something that still happens to this day. Of course, this all stems from movie stars and TV celebrities for about a century at this point. They're given this platform and play this character. People look up to them. The internet culture meant the portrayal of these characters they invented had to go beyond the movie or TV show in a sense. And when you're labeled, signed on, sponsored, whatever, you become a product. That's what Sayaka Bayan was, a digital product. Same for what we call e-celebs. There's a lot of talk about internet culture that's interestingly still relevant to this day, especially in the placebo chapter. Talks about the generational gap and that realization that you're having a harder time understanding people that are younger than you. It even talks about online writers and how they congregate this audience that understands them while their work looks completely incomprehensible to others. How the hell was Uka already this on the ball regarding internet culture back in the late 90s? We already talked a lot about what it means to have yourself on the internet to a point you didn't consent to, but what about when you do consent to it? What about when you try everything to get on that platform, to shout to the world as loud as you can to your best ability? I think Old Man, Neutral, and these weirdos in Kamui Net just wanted to be heard. I think that's what all of us want, especially those who put ourselves out there online. To a lot of people, probably even including the HCU, these delinquents are seen as insignificant and powerless, considering how quickly the lights were flicked back on after they shut them off. But Old Man and Neutral, and the rest of the people of Kamui Net that made that moment possible, I bet it felt really good. They ruled the goddamn world, if even just for a few seconds. And I think that made this all worth it for them. There's just something beautiful about that. So, the sad new wave song of the day is The Perfect Kiss. Looking over the lyrics, the heaviest themes are both love and death. While the songwriter, Bernard Summer, admits they didn't have any specific meaning in mind, people drew conclusions that it was about Ian Curtis, lead singer of Joy Division, that committed suicide. But, perhaps with the context of Kamui Drome, it could be seen as being about Sayaka Bayan. Pretending not to see his gun, I said let's go out and have some fun. This can be construed as disregarding what dangers of someone's well-being you're ignoring. You're more... Shit, why is this written like this? This can be construed as disregarding what dangers of one's well-being you're ignoring and how you're more concerned at the moment about enjoying yourself. Like all the people supporting this underground peep show on the poor idol, and of course, the song ending with, My friend, he took his final breath. Now I know the perfect kiss is the kiss of death. Bayan had this rabid fan base following her. These people who wanted nothing else than to be her friend or more in their sick and depraved ways. She ended her life feeling that perfect kiss and it changed the world for a lot of people. Some could say acts like stalking her private life is what further charged this underground Kamui net and kickstarted a revolution for these kids. Sometimes it only takes a single act like that to cause such a big change in people. The final main chapter of the game, Life Cut. Tokyo, like a proud journalist, is bringing us up to speed regarding Kamui since this chapter is all about him. Not only has he managed to escape, but there's now a new string of murders on politicians and it all traces back to Kamui. We see a news update as the illustrious culprit is becoming more of a public figure in the mainstream with these reports. We even see what some people think of Kamui and while some find him to be a despicable human being, others have nothing but admiration for him. 
Okay, pal. Good way to start a sentence. Hey, we even see a live-action Tokyo for a second. And as expected, he has some interesting thoughts on Kamui in this matter, about what he represents, and what kind of change his actions can bring to the world and society as a whole. November 23rd, we see Munakata and Tetsu have a meeting about a group of killers supposedly under Kamui codenamed Trump. Munakata thinks they might even be puppets strung up by the government, but Tetsu doesn't buy it. He says they're likely just some loonies trying to ride Kamui's coattail. Munakata continues explaining TRO and CCO. The former focuses on the evolution of technology, while the CCO is focusing on maintaining the country's current way of life. Refusal to change. And, uh... He does not elaborate further, which confuses Tetsu and us. As soon as he leaves, though, a lone gunman points his sights at Munakata. November 30th, back at HCU, Nakatagawa announces Sumio getting outed from the team since... you know. Kotobuki became commissioner, which makes Nakatagawa the new chief director, and other members of Central are pairing up with HCU to work together in ending the Kamui case. From Central, we got Kenta Mikoshiba and Sakura Natsume, the latter being Daigo's daughter that he mentioned before, her previous job being Special Forces. Mikoshiba is paired with Tetsu, while Natsume tags along with you, Blakira. They've got a lead that Kamui has fled to the International Environment Building, so everyone heads there to try cornering him. However, before that, Tetsu meets up with Kotobuki on the HCU rooftop. It feels very solemn, with this discussion of apologies and the sepia tone and heartbeat. Almost like these two are saying goodbye to each other right here and now. They also talk about how the Kamui case reaching the mainstream has caused more underground organizations to service into society. He names Epheso, which to me says something about their current panic in getting the public back in their control. But as Kotobuki admits defeat, saying that dreaded phrase, it can't be helped, that is when Tetsu shoots him dead. Later that night, everyone is heading to the building to corner Kamui. They plan to chase him to the rooftop while snipers are ready to take him out from there. Tetsu's already gone AWOL, however, while remaining in the building. You actually run into him shortly after, as he lets you know he's ditching HCU altogether. He gives you some advice, how the truth and the facts are not the same. What does that mean? I guess what Tetsu is getting at here is the biggest difference between truth and facts. The concept of a fact is based on objectivity, something that is indisputable. Within facts is always the truth, objectively speaking. But what about the truth? Philosophically speaking, truth is more tied to a belief, what you feel inside to be the truth, a feeling, a belief. These are not facts, but it's the truest thing you know, deep inside. We'll come back to this a little later as we dissect the story. Next floor, you run into Morikawa. He says he knows Tetsu killed Kotobuki and that he's got orders to take him down. Your whole team is losing their damn minds. Hachisuka too. She even says if Kamui is killed, it won't stop the idea. This crime virus. The media will keep showing him, showing his actions. People will know. They'll cheer for it. Kamui will never truly die, but instead become a martyr. Happens all the time in real life. Then, <laughs> she's just an asshole to Natsume for no reason? <laughs> Good, great. You both head to floor 47, running into Mikoshiba, who says he received orders to kill Tetsu as well. He also drops a little bomb that Kamui never actually killed anyone. Something I feel like we could have pieced together ourselves, but confirmation is always nice. He does not elaborate further, though. You head to floor 52 to run into Tokyo. He seems to be more sympathetic towards you, promising you'll receive a message from him later. Finally, chasing Kamui to the rooftop, we're treated to a scene that shows a nightmare of laser sights zeroing in on him as he's blown away.
Tokyo reports on this incident. While not making a huge change in society, the rip of his mortal coil was felt as many people's anarchic morale went with him. Tokyo shares this sentiment. He also states that multiple HCU members went completely missing after the assassination as well. December 24th. It's almost Christmas, but I don't think Bakira is feeling very festive. Not a Sansa nor tree in sight of his apartment. Looking at Tokyo's email, he tells you about someone called Kinjo that serves as a lead for all this shit to make sense. You go ahead with the lead anyway, and finally meet with Kinjo this time. He says he was ordered by Morikawa to fill you in on some things. A redevelopment corporation is involved in what's happening, essentially turning a page closer to a new way of life. At least for the 24 wards. You control the technology, you control the electricity, you control the transportation, you pretty much got this place in the palm of your hands. And that's what this unknown corporation wants. This is also kind of important for later on. Kinjo also spills on who even came up with Kamui, the tech and civic factions, the TRO and CCO respectively. Remember them? No? That's fine. This is all starting to sound like an analog for manufactured conflict in the world, an ongoing conspiracy. These factions also control the majority of the police force, including the HCU themselves. This whole thing adds to Kamui not being some genius serial killer. His entire story was a facade, an excuse for this secret society to destroy political figures, the ones they needed gone in order to maintain this direction they desired. In fact, the executed Kamui was just one of many. A whole league of Kamuis? As Kinjo explains, this is where the shelter comes in. An underground camp that trains children from very young ages to become brainless pawns for the FSO. And finding that shelter, according to Kinjo, will awaken a new Kamui to resurface. Later that day, Tetsu and Munakata are at the batting cages again. And hey, Munakata isn't dead! Munakata is describing how these factions responded to Kamui's emergence and how it influenced the society. It seemed like these big heads were scrambling to appear in charge and on top. All it took was some people rebelling for their whole infrastructure to start shaking. Huh, how about that? The FSO is looking to take down a TRO and CCO to become top dog, so to speak. Tetsu takes this in and decides what he should do next. Later in the HCU, Nakatagawa's updating you, Mikoshiba, and Natsume after the successful assassination of Kamui. What's left? That Trump group, apparently. Think of them as struggling leftover minions to deal with after the death of their king. Despite being set up like a league of bosses, they aren't that important. Feels like a Metal Gear parody, to be honest. The two Greenhorns are taken aback by how cold Nakatagawa is about his former colleagues. Later in your apartment, you receive an email from Kinjo. He clues you in where to go next, the Mahalan Smoke Shop. So you head there and find a secret underground entrance. You go down, down, further down down to the deepest part of the 24 wards, running into... Hey, Tokyo! He heeds you with a pretty severe warning. He says going down here changed him forever, and it's going to change you as well. You proceed to take the path as all your memories of this past year are flowing through you. You reach an underground railroad of sorts. Morikawa confides in you. He was also part of this secret organization. He tells you to look over his notebook before he's shot and killed. A train arrives, and as you enter it and look out the window, you see Morikawa's killer, Tetsu. He looks back at you like a scared child that doesn't know what he's doing, but is also slightly annoyed. <laughs> The 
The train takes you to a room where Hachisuka is waiting for you, sporting serious villain vibes. She seems to be part of the society's plan as well, with the intent to kill Tetsu. Her little entrance is cut short by Natsume, who is tailing you the whole time. Back at the batting center, does Murakata live here? <laughs> the requester this time is Nakatagawa. He pins Munakata as part of TRO and demands to know where Tetsu went. Munakata tells him he went to the shelter while he's basically dead to rights. What is, what is Munakata saying? Nakatagawa is... In the, the case of the high school. <laughs> How are we into younger girls? Yeah, she was a high school student. I used some of my more trust connections to trace her movements. Nice. I just happen to have some minor business to attend to. Jesus Christ! The two go on about something known as Ayame Mass Pro. But what does that mean? Nakatagawa also claims there's no FSO, TRO, or even CCO, but they're just puppets controlled by an even bigger, more invisible entity that only goes by the code name Elbow. While I can't confidently say it's of utmost importance to know this, it's definitely interesting to keep in mind. Anyway, Project Elbow is what's really pulling all the strings, controlling another layer of facade over all of this, while disguised as three factions. Just to further dig down this commentary of artificial conflict in the world, which sounds familiar to some of you watching this, I'm sure. Just as Nakatagawa goes for the kill, Mikoshiba comes in and takes him out. He's also as confused as us about all this, but Munakata says something worth keeping in mind. Formal records and official announcements aren't to be trusted. They can be as easily forged and fraudulent as anything else. Again, facts and truths are always different. Oh, and he also kills Mikoshiba. Why? I don't know. Maybe because he thought he was a central member, just like Nakatagawa? That's just a guess, though. Back underground, Natsume is describing the experiments that were running in the shelter. Members of the government within the wards were taking residents for secret projects in order to attempt improving the human condition. They evaluated citizens and their potential criminal behavior. How? Probably discrimination, if we're to be frank. Every citizen was observed, and their information was stored in a databank. Nothing but zeros and ones. 20 years since the project began, citizens of the 24 wards are considered the most suitable for the society they have in mind. Part of their goal was the fruition of the HCU. Of course, they were part of the plan to help big government control the society. But now for the actual shelter aspect in all this. This was called the Shelter Kids Policy. The policy was essentially a brainwashing program, and they managed to have over 1,400 of them released onto the wards in order to build some sort of adulthood. According to Natsume, none of them have any real memories of what happened, many ending up with normal lives within Japan. Others joined certain organizations, such as the Special Forces. While they think they have their own agency, they're under the thumb of this secret project. The Kamui we've been following around, of course, was one of these children. And this is why he has this huge criminal background. And you know who else was one of those 1400 plus children? You! Uh, Blakira, the main character. Natsume describes Kamui as not a single individual, but rather an idea, a base concept for what the shelter project was pursuing. This is what they meant before when they said killing an individual on that rooftop didn't destroy Kamui, because Kamui isn't just flesh, but an idea in this society. The spirit of Kamui will only be inherited onto others, but it's not specifically just Kamui, the female equivalent to this idea is named Ayame, which explains where the Ayame character from the first chapter came from, as well as how she was so close to Kamui in the first place. Ayame Mass Pro was also a separate aspect of the project with its own set of 1400 plus girls. Nearly 3000 brainwashed children littered across the wards. Hachisuka was one of those girls as well, the first one even. As a little girl, she was submitted into this project by her father, the mayor of the ward. Perhaps that was what she meant as just being a doll. 
The doll in the first chapter was telling a story about what sounds like a happy utopia being created, perhaps artificially. She was sending a message. Perhaps Hachisuka became aware, somehow, of where she came from and what her purpose was. To perpetuate this perfect society that these factions were trying to build, she has no agency, no control of herself. She's just a doll. You're among friends too, as Natsume was one of these girls as well. You arrive at the shelter plaza, which looks like an underground town in itself. This is where the Kamuis and Ayames are raised. You see these giant towers? You gotta go inside every single one, walk up these long spiral staircases, and check each individual room for something to interact with. The game doesn't tell you, but you need to find four dead bodies. Most of the rooms are empty, but miss just one and you can't make progress. So be sure to check every room, otherwise you have to start all over again. How fun! <laughs> Besides the dead bodies of each and every individual Trump member, you also find files about the shelter program. All kinds of information about curriculums and shit. A lot of this just seems like noise, but I think it's meant to show how dedicated this organization was to producing citizens they saw fit. There's also reports on their experiments that led to the creation of the Silver Eye. What is the Silver Eye? Regarding the process progress? According to reports, they were putting a lot of these children through rigorous psychologic training and observation, and those they found to be qualified would be put under surgery where they tried to replace one of their eyeballs with a silver eye. The administrators would go through the thousands of children and qualify only a fraction of them as having this silverization gene, but even that gene wasn't a guarantee that it would work for them. But when it did, according to their notes, the Silver Eye can provide immortality to whomever possesses it. This shit was taken so seriously that administrators were threatened with death if they didn't follow protocol. Regarding every child, only 272 of them were considered close enough to achieving this silver ocular gene thing. They even processed any kid that didn't make the cut. With all that in mind, among the near 3,000 children they harbored in these underground shelters, only 272 of them were considered passing individuals. What happens to all of them isn't really known yet. After exploring every tower, you run into Tetsu, looking defeated himself. He knows a lot about the shelter and how Kamui grew up in it. He rests the blame of such a reprehensible establishment solely on corporations that were supporting this experiment, while questioning what's the point of his own line of work, especially now that he knows the truth, the deepest truth. Hard to think this is the same guy acting like some force of justice, blasting lead into the face of a downed lunatic back in the introduction. He also states the Trump members were shelter kids themselves. He called them Kamui's guard dogs, and his last wish is to see who the next Kamui is which, according to him, is you. As you take this elevator, Tetsu reveals that this program was conjured up by elder members of the government to gain more political power. We also learn through Placebo that the Mikumo 77 incident is why they came up with the idea. Don't want to deal with another citizen uprising, huh? And this project was led by a man known as Kamui. Not the one from the previous chapters, but the original Kamui, Format Kamui, an infamous hitman from the 70s. He worked for the FSO, and it was said he assassinated all the elder members that came up with the program in the first place. In the midst of this, Tetsugoro Kusabi himself was called in to take Kamui out, which he did. And that was the Silver Case, the root incident to all of this. The events of the Silver Case were never made public, but its effect on the 24 wards is ever-present. The TV tower that incident occurred in became an unmanned relay tower. And what is this for? Well, Tetsu is here to show you. After one last puzzle from the Elders of Secret Graves, you head into what looks like a beast of a control room known as the Black Box. A mess of wires and monitors, all surrounded by this... fat nerd. For some clarity, the placebo chapter describes this person as named Nezu, an assigned controller of the wards who is basically treating this position like a round of Sim City. This connects to what Kinjo was describing earlier. He controlled the 24 wards with this immense power. Regardless, he does not do anything to stop what happens next. Tetsu is grateful for your help to enter this room, but also says it's up to you if you want to commit to becoming the next Kamui. You approach the nerd. 
Tetsu says if you kill him, you'll be free from this curse. Will you kill your past or die with it weighing you down? The choice is yours. Except it isn't since you just watched this scene play out. With the firing of a gun, you fade into a forest. What a nut. You guys basically killed this modern god and Tetsu's just like, hey, let's go outside. Still with him, he's exhausted from everything, but relieved. He relishes the idea of being home with his family. Merry Christmas. We're back at the batting cages. Munakata and Tetsu are talking about your fate. He thinks Blakira will serve as a reset button of sorts for this criminal mind. While the age of criminality he is used to has ended, a new era is on the horizon. Tetsu adds that this Kamui is no longer present in a few individuals, but now everyone dwelling in the 24 wards. Still, what's important to Tetsu is the possibility of every individual's spirit and seizing that light. You can't have light without darkness, but you also have to do your best fending it off. I think what he means is one has to find that balance, coalesce with both the darkness and the light. Perhaps he's telling you here that you've been lost in darkness for decades at this point, and it's about time to start embracing that light. World in Motion. The Silver Case. So, this chapter had everything crashing down, to the slaughtering of various HCU members, to Tetsugoro Kusabi's confessions as a witness to this entire Kamui project, to the revelation that the 24 Wards was essentially nothing more than some fat jerk-off playing a video game, controlling various aspects of the 24 Wards, and observing the ongoing events overhead. Like I said, a literal god of sorts. This is likely an analog for gamers in general, as well as another example of Suda not exactly breaking the fourth wall, but rather including you, the player, as part of the narrative. It's something that comes up one way or another in pretty much every game he's directed. That must be why Nezu looks just like me! With the resemblance of a bowling alley cartoon, I think this adds to how otherworldly he's supposed to appear when compared to the rest of the game. Literally out of this world. Like you, the player, outside of the silver case, you, you get it? It's hard to say if either main character managed to achieve anything world-changing throughout this ordeal, but I think they both managed to grab a sense of agency, express your individuality, seize that light, and tell everyone else to fuck off. I'm not going to say this is the absolute best way to approach real life, but the game clearly has a lot to say about what big government and bigger corporations want to control the lives of countless people that they likely only see as statistics. Seeing Suda and Uka express the importance of individualism in this game is refreshing, especially seeing it's a fairly recurring theme in the rest of their work. Let's move on towards the song for this chapter, World in Motion. The lyrics infer confidence in a competition. Express yourself. Create the space. You know you can win. Don't give up the chase. Beat the man. Take him on. You never give up. It's one on one. Kind of reminds me of the competitive slash achievement obsessed aspect of video games, which makes me think of, well, Nezu. Now is the time. Let everyone see. You never give up. That's how it should be. Don't get caught. Make your own play. Express yourself. Don't give it away. I believe this could be about Blakira and perhaps even Tokyo finally having his own agency and determining his destiny right here and now. This is the time, what everything before this has been leading towards. It's time for him to express himself and make his own play. Will he be just another Kamui or blaze his own path? Now how soccer plays into all this, I'm not sure. Suda's a big soccer fan, or a big football fan. Love's got the world in motion, and I know what we can do. Love's got the world in motion, and I believe it's true. 
But where is the love in the silver case? In the 24 wards? Perhaps in Tetsugoro Kusabi. The word love is associated with very raw emotions. This project was looking to try dissecting those emotions out of their citizens so they can stay in line. Tetsu doesn't believe in this and was able to go against the position of conformity he was forced into and perhaps it was love that encouraged him to see through this to the end. I think I also see love in various forms as the core of these stories. The love between Ayami and Kamui, the love Koichi had for Hikaru, the love that was shared between the Mikuma boys and Riru, the love that rapidly blossomed between old man and neutral, and now the love Tetsu has for life, the future, his family, his partner, and his individuality. Like the song says, it's love that's got the world in motion. As dark and heavy as this world can get, it cannot exist without love. In undated time after the last chapter, you meet up with Tetsu to have a little chat, with Sumio in jail and the rest decomposing. Tetsu is pretty much your only buddy. He reveals that he killed those old politicians himself, and Kamui was just a pawn to them. Again, even that Kamui, not a killer. Also that his silver eyes were gouged out for further use due to their most significant power, immortality. I guess they also live in a world where an eyeball transplant is as easy as... Oh, and uh, Tetsu didn't kill him either. Yeah, this game really likes flipping statements and facts on you constantly. You just kind of have to learn to take it. Like Bokira, look at him. He has taken it all quite well. Tetsu only believes in the power of the silver eye because he saw it right in front of his normal eyes. He shot at the old man that was stealing Kamui's eyes, perhaps fatally, but due to the power of the eye, he easily walked away. This old man, by the way, was Mayor Hachisuka. Killing his own son and stealing his identity, he is actually Chizuru's grandfather, not father. Tetsu also spills the fact that she and Tokyo were siblings, which definitely tracks considering they were shelter kids. Mayor sacrifices grandkids for this experiment. He emphasizes how we're in the budding of a new era, but not without ending this dialogue with a phrase we've heard before. Lend me 50,000 yen. The reason for this callback befuddles me. These aren't horse races we're talking about at the moment. This became a running gag among fans. Kinda reminds me how that one line Frank says in Dead Rising 1 got really popular, and I've still got no clue as to why. I've covered wars, you know. It could emphasize that even with Tetsu's lone wolf cop gone wrong fuck off attitude, he's still someone that has some sort of dependency on others, especially those he can trust. <laughs> Oh, uh, the end. Yeah, there's a call in on the death of Mayor Hachisuka, but we'll talk about that later. Funny enough, some of this dialogue struck me as odd when replaying this game. Coincidentally, Steel Ball Runner recently explained that the original text derived from a retirement speech by Antonio Inoki, a pro wrestler turned politician who was famous in Japan, and his speech ended with the line, Go, without hesitation, you'll know when you go there, and then shouting a big thanks to the crowd at the end. Their talk here is supposed to be a direct reference to that speech. So, in a way, this is supposed to be like all those video games that had an end screen that says, Thanks for playing! This is where we'd go over the entirety of the story, as this is where the original game ended. But with the remake and its updates, there's a new bit of story left that we should cover. Sometime after the 2016 remake launched, a free update added two short, brand new chapters, one for Transmitter and one for Placebo. As far as I can tell, production was already commencing for remaking the 25th Ward, this game's direct sequel, during the time of this update. So Transmitter's new chapter, known as Whiteout Prologue in tiny letters, serves as a thread connecting the games. It's February of 2003, a little over three years since the original game ended. 
This short chapter is about a young, spry police officer known as Shiro Yabu, fresh into this line of work. He'll do anything he's told and only wants to support his mother, so he says. A real Boy Scout, a perfect citizen, if you will. We're back at the batting cages, a wheelchair-bound Munakata is talking to Kosaka, who seems to run errands for him now. Munakata brings up Sentai heroes and how they're a basic group of defenders taking on evil beings, and how new characters get introduced over time as the villains become more strategic and crafty. Munakata compares the original Sentai characters to the Trump members under Kamui, which I guess would make Tetsu the dastardly villain that outsmarted them in this scenario. That's when Munakata shows him this Joker card. Strongly inferring a new loyal member for Kamui, the latest martyr, has emerged. Also, apparently Kosaka and Sakura went out. Scandalous. What the fuck, Munakata? <laughs> Where is this coming from? <laughs> Kosaka contacts Sakura about the new intel. Next scene has her with you, Blakira. She believes there's more to Joker than being a new Trump member, but an entirely new fiend altogether. As you're heading back into the shelter area, you're being ordered to kill this Joker. You must kill the past once and for all, but not before Shiroyabu stops you on your tracks, claiming you're the Joker. As he demands you comply with him, everything fades to black as a gunshot sounds off. Dead souls. The silver case. So, what happened here? Well, a lot of things that will only make sense once we talk about the 25th Ward. When will that be? <laughs> well, like I said, this chapter was created because the 25th Ward was finally on its way. It also creates new intrigues for both games, including Bakira's connection with Kamui as well as Shiryabu's past one of the main characters in the 25th Ward. A bit of intrigue I couldn't help but notice is that Sakura seems aware that Blakira still keeps in touch with Tetsu, while the rest of the remaining HCU do not. As for the Joy Division song referenced at the end, Dead Souls, the lyrics and nature of the song are about a person suffering from a series of mental disorders, such as Dissociative Identity Disorder and Schizophrenia. I think the song is directed towards Shiroyabu, a character we barely know anything about at this point in the timeline, but we'll come to learn in the 25th Ward, where figures from the past stand tall, and mocking voices ring the halls. While the game is about killing the past, Shiroyabu will soon see what it means when you're unable to do that. Maybe we'll revisit what warning this song is giving in a future video. Moving on, I want to talk more about the game, its themes, and what's being expressed, but I think we need to shine some light on a particular character before that. So, for people that have successfully played through the Silver Case correctly, you might be wondering what's the deal with Tokyo Morishima. As I've said before, this is the main character of the Placebo B-Side chapters, 
written by Masahi Uka, and he's as background as background characters get as far as the transmitter section of the game is concerned. It's when you experience the placebo chapters do you see he's someone who gets a lot of gears turning for the HCU in such small, subtle ways that they never really notice. The Frank Willis of this world, if you will. Everything Tokyo does in relation to the HCU and their current objectives facilitate the cases and stories, which makes sense. He is there to help the player better understand what's going on. The placebo chapters serve as both recaps and further dissection of each individual character he's parallel to. Which is why I don't bring up his stories too much, as they're usually reiterating or clarifying parts of Transmitter stories, which I figured made more sense to bring up pieces I found most appropriate. The idea of aiding the Transmitter chapters is exemplified various times throughout his stories too. Tokyo was led to the mall in a trance to cross paths with Blakira and the rest of the crew during Decoy Man, strengthening his relationship with the HCU while subconsciously forming a connection with Blakira. He had his old reporting partner Erika investigate Koichi's situation much further than anyone from the police bothered to, leading to his absolute confession in Spectrum, he solved riddles provided by Hiseki from Parade, and it's inferred that these exchanges led to the Mikuma boys begin execution of their plan to destroy the Yukimura Corporation, he sent Blakira the lead in Kamui Drome himself, while also bringing the Kamui case to light for the public to witness. He explored the underground shelters himself, which ultimately led to not only confronting his grandfather, Mayor Hachisuka, but killing him in the process as he stole his silver eye. Of course, the guy's got his own quandaries going on too, which I'll go over here. He's a very introverted man, once a reporter for a news site, he's now an independent journalist who may not ever show even a hint of enthusiasm for his work, but he's pretty good at it. All the while does almost everything in his power to avoid communicating with anyone, especially in person. His tiny list of friends throughout the game include an eccentric bartender, his ex-lover slash reporting partner Erica, a secret hacker known as Slash who ends up perishing trying to do a task for him, and a turtle, Red, whom he keeps closest. While shedding light on the cases we go over, perhaps it shouldn't be a surprise that he has his own darkness to deal with. And what is that darkness? Tokyo's struggles are pretty minor at first, getting harassed by an anonymous user known as the Bat, disruptive outside forces, and an uncooperative Tetsugoro Kusabi. Of course, his life mutates and diminishes more and more as he's living out these monotonous, considerably mind-numbing days. All the while, Tokyo's life gets stranger as he pursues these cases, but what is it that keeps him going? He was firstly scouted to keep tabs on Kamui as news regarding his reawakening were beginning to leak. He had no money, he was seriously broke, so this doof took on a case in exchange of lucrative payment. Throughout this journey, he would end up learning so much about himself, such as clairvoyant link with beings of the afterlife, and deep connections with people in his proximity that are at death's door. Visions he has regarding what is considered a value in living, what you are worth in this world. It's a whole lot of things, really, and Tokyo takes it all in as passively as possible, living his disheveled life mostly in front of his computer trying to make sense of the situations he finds himself in. From the start, he's very downtrodden. He doesn't believe in himself or his journalistic skills. Things begin to turn a bit as Erika re-enters his life and helps him with just about all the cases. One can also consider his near-death situations also causing some sort of motivation. When you start becoming the man that knows too much, well, I think that's a good sign of your journalism. I feel I should talk a bit about the music as well. I owe it to Masafumi Takata for composing such a fantastic score, especially for Placebo. I love how it's implemented throughout Tokyo's ordeals. His main theme song that plays the most is rather bubbly, almost loopy. Like he's always waking up in a daze or just letting it all hang out while in his humble abode. People thought it was weird how quickly it shifted to his serious mode computer time song whenever you start using his PC, but I don't know, isn't that kind of what it feels like for some of us? Whether you're writing up some sort of essay, doing your taxes, drawing up your latest art piece, shit posting on socials, it's all serious business. And this music perfectly expresses that. Or the Apricot Square music. It's so wistful, gloomy, and beautiful at the same time.
How appropriate is it that this song begins to play when Tokyo gets to see his ex-girlfriend and reporting partner Erika in person for the first time in years? I feel as though this track accentuates old feelings coming back up, ones that he has to hold back. Perhaps a part of him wants to share that old love with her once again, but can't. As one should expect, Masafumi Takata is a musical god. The Silver Case contains, without a doubt, some of the absolute best work in his career. And just an example for storytelling through music, and perhaps to avoid confusion regarding some of what's being expressed here, the music you hear while exploring the shelters as Blakira is the same music you hear when Tokyo is talking to this shadowy figure. So, this tells us either he's literally in the shelters during these scenes, or he's talking to someone that has a deep involvement with the Shelter Kids program, which would be Mayor Hachisuka, which seems likely. We even passed by Tokyo as he was leaving the shelters. After Tetsu told us about Mayor Hachisuka possessing the Silver Eye, Sakura informing us that said Mayor had been found dead, I don't think it's a stretch to say that Tokyo killed him possibly after taking his silver eye. Maybe this is an awkward place to talk about that, but a lot of this was told from song selection alone, and I wanted to express that. Last thing about the soundtrack, for those that might be wondering, I never played the game with the newly remixed music by Akira Yamaoka and Erika Ito, and only recently listened to them. Surprisingly, I did not enjoy these versions at all. They just feel bloated and busy, like they added too much to these original compositions, and the vocals that Ito insisted upon are just ridiculous. I say I'm surprised how little I enjoyed these new tracks because I generally love Yamaoka's work when he isn't falling asleep on the keyboard for a western Silent Hill game, and Erika Ito would go on to compose for the 25th Ward, specifically the placebo chapters in that game, and her compositions are phenomenal, some of the best tracks overall. Moving on. Discovering not only how strong of a hand Tokyo had with influencing the cases that the HCU were involved in, but also his deep-rooted ties with the Shelter Project as a surviving Shelter Kid that was also the grandson of Mayor Hachisuka, it shows us that he's just as main of a character as Blakira, perhaps more so. Probably helps that he has an actual personality. And dialogue. I've got a pet turtle. You told me. Wanna see it? See what? My turtle! I got a, I got a photo of him right here. Sure, show me. Here it is. Let's see. Oh, this is rather nasty. What? He's cute. Oh, oh he's cute. He's smiling. <laughs> what? Wait a second. What's nasty about it? <laughs> I mean, the patterns in this face. His face? He's fucking smiling. <laughs> is this him smiling? <laughs> Whatever. You hurt my feelings. No. <laughs> I'm going home. Fuck, man. I can't believe you just don't see how lovely he is. He's the most relatable character. <laughs> see? Like Bakira, but at a much deeper level, Tokyo's connection with the dead is prominent, evolving into a spirit medium where these passing souls speak through him as we saw near the end of the game. But, of course, Tokyo is also the ultimate example of the worst inheritance possible. As the game states, much like Blakira, he was meant to be a messenger for Kamui, someone that helps transmit this crime disease, someone who's weighed down by some of the biggest baggage that derives from this background, his history, and even his family. I think Mayor Hachisuka, his grandfather, at the very end describes him best with his last line, he's just an unfortunate son. But that isn't going to bring Tokyo down. He already started the game at the bottom, but will keep rising from the ashes, on his own accord. His imperfections, like all of us, give his life meaning. Perhaps Tokyo's absolute refusal to love, to emote, to goddamn feel something, comes from this unfortunate shelter background. But I think he is ready to live in this world on his own terms. He isn't fit for this perfect society, this utopia that these corporations are trying to build. He is ready to seize that light. His soul is becoming a beacon of light and seeing dawn finally arrive. With that said, it's fitting that the next time we see Tokyo after this entire ordeal is on a plane flying through the bright blue sky. Yami is a tiny bonus chapter Uka wrote for the remake. May 2nd, a handful of months after the original game ended. Tokyo received a new email on his laptop. Really man? You get internet up in this bitch? This is a cutting edge plane for the year 2000. The email just says one thing. The bat is always watching. However, we also hear from Slash. 
Turns out, while dead, she has been essentially digitized into a program, something we'll see carried on down the line. A girl sitting next to him shows concern for his eye, but Tokyo strongly infers, basically to us, that it's a silver eye and working just fine. Her name is Catherine. It's strongly implied that she isn't even real, peering into Tokyo's mind. He describes his silver eye to the girl that his curse of immortality means that the program you would call life has been suspended for you. He even infers that Catherine herself is part of this curse. How this relates to events later, we'll tackle then and there. Tokyo is off to not only attack his past, but the past of others. Don't worry, we'll see him next time on the sunny island of Los Pass. I think one of the reasons Tokyo is so well liked among fans is because of how real he is. Not just the way he's depicted, but also the many, many little instances and situations that are more grounded than anything else in the game. From shenanigans with an ex that you've long time ignored, caring about your pet more than anything else and talking to them like they're another person, falling for a computer virus like a goddamn idiot, dealing with loud ass construction that's dedicated to destroying any piece of quiet in your vicinity constantly procrastinating on things you need to get done, getting cyber bullied, forgetting to reach out to your parents, buying expensive shit you probably can't afford, not paying back friends, and my favorite, Tokyo is even smart and real enough not to be suckered into a piece of shit computer desk, but instead using a billiard table that he probably found outside to house his desktop. Pro tip, personal computer desks are wobbly pieces of garbage, don't buy one. Beyond all the paranormal shit going on, beyond his history, Tokyo is by and far the most normal, grounded person in the game. Probably in the entire Grasshopper library. And while relatability isn't something I find to be entirely important, I think it can make for great and memorable characters. He is constantly falling into situations of happenstance, but doesn't care enough to achieve greatness. Only doing what he can throughout the game to try finding peace of mind. Something I think is the goal for any underachiever. He just like me. Tokyo Morishima sports ultimate individualism better than any other character in this game. This bothers me even more than the last riddles. To me, it just seems like some pretentious ass bullshit text. Meant to sound meaningful. One last thing. Like how we ended this chapter peering into the songs, let's talk about all the ones shown in Tokyo's chapters. All the Way, True Faith, Shell Shock, Love Less, Blue Monday, and Singularity. All the Way, I think, is about someone who's a black sheep in their society and chooses not to care about that. Also someone who refuses to be dependent on others. A very prickly shelled individual that does not want to open up to anyone or anything. True Faith is obviously about a drug addict, but it can also be seen as someone who's obsessed with this repetition, the way of life they're used to, afraid of things starting to change. Shellshock is about someone digging deeper into the truth and beginning to go against a faith they've been holding for a long time. Love Less seems to be about a parent or guardian losing the love and connection they have with their child. Blue Monday appears to be from the perspective of someone dealing with an abusive person that is controlling your life. And as the song progresses with these feelings being expressed, it ends with the victim freeing themselves of this situation. And finally, Singularity is about reaching out to someone they're longing for, while doing everything they can to escape what they considered home or their past. So looking at all these lyrics, I think they describe Tokyo's character and situations perfectly. His unwelcoming, closed-in way of life in Yume, his repetition lifestyle getting wedged by outside forces in Hana, the secrets he is uncovering beginning to undo his faith in Suki, an implied relationship he had with Nzawa, a man he met in the first chapter who ended up being one of the shelter's caretakers and possibly guardian for Tokyo as a child, and deforming into a standoff that meant the end of his life, and I, Tokyo ending this connection he had with his grandfather that forced the shelter fate into him, killing him once and for all in Hikari, and finally, doing his best to leave his past and find a new purpose in Yami. Seeing all of these songs form the biggest beats in the Silver Case really emphasizes how much the likes of Suda and Uka not just value music as an art form, but also the meanings they tend to have. Oh fuck.
So now that I've described the entirety of the game to the best of my ability, I want to understand what Suda was trying to say with these stories. The core of it is him making a case study on crime itself. Why do people commit crimes? What causes it to happen? What is the root? And how does it affect other people and societies? Who gets to commit crime? Also, to a degree, why some people would want others to commit them. As far as I can tell, a lot of Suda's inspiration for the game came from a famous incident that occurred in Japan. So a kind of strange thing happened while I was working on Moonlight Syndrome, the Sakaki Bara murders. It was a huge deal in Japan, so because of that, my games and games in general had a bunch of government censorship limitations placed on them. So after that, I wasn't able to make Moonlight Syndrome as I originally intended. Given all the government restrictions back then, I decided I wanted to delve into the themes of serial killers, how people can end up like that. You know, like what creates a serial killer. Is it because of something in their DNA? Is it because of their family or their environment? Or where they live, their schools, or the government? What pushes a person to do something like that? So after a lot of thinking and putting stories together, I came up with the silver case. The Sakaki Bara incident he mentioned is more commonly known as the Kobe Child Murders. This incident occurred in 1997 where a teenager killed two children and left one of their severed heads with a note inside the mouth for the police to find. The news of this incident quickly spread across Japan and as Suda stated, promptly led to regulations for violent fiction and media. As far as I can tell, this is why you still typically do not see depictions of dismemberment occur in even the most recent video games when playing their respective Japanese version, including Suda's own games. Moonlight Syndrome, one of Suda's first projects in the video game industry, was a very early example of said government restriction. So, while Suda's time working at a funeral parlor certainly influenced his aspect on death, which would bleed onto his future projects as director, being fresh out of Moonlight Syndrome's production was on his mind the most while developing the Silver Case. Again, that aspect of what makes a criminal, and what are different types of criminals. You know, like cops. Just like the real world, cops are often criminals themselves throughout the Silver Case. Sakamoto even said this to his ops partners that they need to possess more of this criminal power than the criminals themselves, even comparing their own work to typical crime. Kotobuki even says you're almost built like a criminal, which helped convince him to hire you as part of the HCU. It's not the most original idea, but I'm glad this crime thriller story doesn't really try to glorify cops, but more often criticize their work, trails of corruption, and mutated sense of justice throughout. Suda has also discussed how each storyline actually came from different ideas that he had for a new game while he was planning to leave Human Entertainment. This was my first original game, but there were four different games I wanted to make, so the Silver Case has everything I wanted to express and create. There are various inspirations in there, but I want people to see the Silver Case as the coalescence of everything I wanted to do at the time, and my passion. It makes sense the more I look at these as separate pieces, most of which have rather thin connections to the overall story. Clearly, Suda was enamored by crime thrillers at the time, but these all tackle different perspectives on it, whether by one committing it or the victim. Decoy Man is about a criminal doing their best to cover their tracks in order to manipulate the society within. I think the case of Ayame can also serve as a crime of passion. Spectrum tackles the idea of a mere child committing crime due to the inability to cope with the loss of their friend. Parade is a long string of crimes and bears the question of what is or isn't justifiable when we see those committing it and their motivations. And lastly, Kamui Drome depicts the birth of cybercrime, a whole new field that is too advanced for the officers assigned to research and understand. This explains why these four chapters don't have a lot in common besides the overlapping characters, and nothing really comes together until Life Cut, which brings everything to a head-splitting conclusion. The nature of Suda cramming various game ideas into one is something he would also do in future projects, most notably Travis Strikes Again. Speaking more on that game, I kind of love how the Silver Case uses various animation techniques to present its few moments of animated storytelling, from traditional to live action FMV, etc. This is very similar to how Suda opted for those introduction scenes in Travis Strikes Again that also used various types of animation. Just another example of said game being this amalgamation of Suda himself returning to his roots and hitting the basics in order to rekindle his love for making video games. I also think this emphasizes further on how these stories were completely separate ideas in Suda's head before they all got merged into the Silver Case. I believe these chapters all have one thing in common though, even lunatics while we're talking about the overall story. 
There's a lot of concern over the future generations, the future of societies as we know it. These old dads talking about their young daughters coming up in the world, this woman trying to selfishly influence a new generation of Kamuis, a little kid learning what murder and death is so early in his age, a group of tortured souls ganging up on a corporation to try bettering the future of societies, a bunch of weirdos growing up on a budding internet culture attempting to claim a new world order, and of course, discovering and digging into this end of criminalization of Kamui's just to find the beginning of a new one. Perhaps this ever-growing concern and even protection of the newer generations and future society is something Tetsugoro Kusabi believed in. I like to think that's why he shot at Mayor Hachisuka with no hesitation, seeing him do something so vile as destroying his later familial generation in order to preserve his own. I think it's also worth mentioning, unlike Mayor Hachisuka, unlike Daigo Natsume, Tetsugoro Kusabi did not sacrifice his daughter to become part of the Ayame project. Well, as far as I know. I'm also not taking the light novel into account as the game itself is already complicated and contradictory as it is. It's really neat thinking about the narrative in this way. While Suda definitely expresses concern over the entrapping evolution that is modern housing and complexes, I think he shows that he's willing to accept the new age of societies and values, and that falls onto the theme of kill the past. As I've said before, the idea of killing the past, in a sense, is about learning to let go, to face your past that weighs you down, destroy it or come to terms with it, and grow for the sake of your future. So a lot of this game deals with the idea of killing the past. People like Sumio and Tetsu are trying their best to kill either their own past or the past of others in hopes for a better future. Meanwhile, certain older characters in the Silver Case, and frankly other games directed by Suda51, that seem too stuck in their quote unquote old fashioned way of doing things, are not looked at in a positive light. As I've said in my Killer7 analysis, this could be a product of a government issue Japan was having where a lot of the ones in charge refused to change their way of handling things. This has been a problem with the country for literal decades at this point. From what I understand, I don't think it's crazy to say Suda is providing his own commentary through his games towards these government bodies along with their stubbornness and refusal to enact significant reforms to make fundamental changes to established practices. It's something that really came out ahead when the Fukushima nuclear disaster occurred in 2011, and this is something Suda has provided commentary for through his games years before this happened. Fukushima. Yeah, I'm here to kill Mr. Fukushima. Huh. That's weird. The Silver Case puts a heavy emphasis on the concept of crime and why it's committed. Individuals that lost their way, those looking to interrupt the flow of society, the police themselves, the corporations, all crime exists even at the top of the ladder. As this game heavily infers that these elites in their ivory towers, too high up for us to even see who they are, also manipulate the system and law enforcers in order for them to do their bidding. Sure, we saw the guy who was controlling the events in 24 wards, but who was controlling him? Who was he taking orders from? Who is Elbow? All of this, we still don't have answers for. But it's still intriguing nonetheless. Anyway, my point is that this is where the theme of kill the past truly began and would be a part of Suda's body of work for literal decades to come. To kill the past is to stop letting your baggage or perhaps even the old ways bring you down. You need to keep going, keep learning new things, keep looking forward to what the future can hold because nothing good comes from dwelling over your past for you will only run circles or possibly seal your fate. Like a lot of auteurs whose fans claim they've predicted the future, that isn't really what Suda is doing with something like this. Rather, he's describing something, whether it be an event or community that was either present for a long time or began budding while he was writing the game. And these cases only blossomed over time, and this helps games like The Silver Case remain relevant to this day, at least in some ways. Let's try to look at each main occurrence in order. There's of course the crazy kids and lunatics. Are they purebred criminals or victims of a failed society? I'm not saying the situation didn't call for the likes of Tetsu and Blakira to open fire, but these people were unable to get the help they needed to avoid this path a long time ago. Films like Parasite and Joker express similar messages very blatantly in their films. 
I bring up those examples specifically to further express that these are still topics and parts of our culture that we as people want to talk about. In Decoy Man, we get to witness how easily fooled people can be with their presumptions on criminality and individuals, something we see happening constantly, especially with the abundance of police mishandling situations in the United States. I can't speak that strongly about how often similar occurrences are with Japanese police, but James certainly can. I left the States pretty much just after I turned 18, and I've been living here almost exclusively ever since. And so I've never really had to deal with the police in the States for anything. I mean, it's not like I'm, I'm getting arrested right and left over here or anything, but having lived here for the majority of my life, I have a, a much better idea of like how, how the system works here. I was kind of worried thinking, okay, I'm, I'm more familiar with the way the system is here in Japan. Luckily going through the game, there wasn't a whole lot of stuff that was based on the way actual police would or at least should be working in real life you know one of the, the biggest differences between the way the japanese police work and the american police work is from what i understand the japanese police to a lot of people surprisingly uh, actually have much more of a tendency towards violence than uh, american police do not as in you know they'll you know they start you know blast in a way like at any given opportunity but for example during like questioning and interrogation and you know just immediately after rest and stuff you've got a lot more you've got a much higher probability of getting your ass kicked uh, in Japan than you would in in the US again I, I know things have sort of shifted a lot over the years but uh, at least at the time you know I mean obviously in any country there's a lot of insecurity and and fear and you know worry and stuff when when dealing with the police because I mean you know the fact that you've been arrested for something is never a good sign in any in any country I guess but in Japan there's a lot more of a sense of like I guess not necessarily dread but just you have no idea what's going on like uh, again you know I've been here a long time I've hung out with and met like lots of people heard lots of stories and stuff and there's a lot more uncertainty, I guess, nervousness when dealing with the police here in Japan. Uh, another thing, too, is in the U.S. at least, I feel like people have a lot more general experience dealing with the police, not necessarily getting like arrested or something like that. But, for example, getting pulled over for speeding or, you know, getting a parking ticket, you know, getting bitched out for like jaywalking or like, you know, littering on the street or something like that. People have a lot more just day to day experience with dealing directly with police than they do here in Japan. For example, as you know, like a, a big dodgy looking white dude, I I, uh, I tend to stand out here in Japan. For some reason, not so much recently, but back in the day, I used to get stopped by the police like all the time, just for like riding my bike around the neighborhood or like walking down the street or something like that. The majority of the time it would be when I'm riding my bike and they're like, oh, hey, wait, wait, excuse me, sir. We need to like check the registration on your bike and check your ID. I'm like, Man, it's my fucking bike. I bought it. Here's my ID. Here's the registration number. I stand there for like 15 minutes while I call it in and check it and say, oh, okay, it all checks out. You can go ahead, sir, you know? And like three days later, I get stopped by the same fucking guy. I'm like, dude, you know it's the same guy. You know, you you know it's me. You stopped me three days ago. I'm wearing the same fucking clothes, you know? Oh, but you know, we, we just got to be sure, sir, you know? Obviously, that doesn't happen to Japanese people all the time, but it happens to it happens to foreigners relatively often you know but for your average japanese person they don't have a whole lot of interaction with police unless it's something like for for example say you know you find like a wallet or something on the street and you go to turn it into the police box or something or you need to uh, you know you happen to see a cop on the street and you need to ask him for directions or something like that driving for one thing is not nearly as uh, as prevalent and common here as it is in the states and simply because of that, you have a lot less people who are used to dealing with, with the police for, again, stuff like getting stopped for speeding or like parking tickets or something like that. Yeah, again, in Japan, when you're suddenly in this situation when you're dealing with the police, I think there's a lot more like nervousness and uncertainty and kind of fear and like not really knowing, you know, how shit's going to go. As there is in the States where, again, you know, it's, it's relatively common to have some sort of interaction with police, you know, whether it's like for something good or bad or neutral or whatever. In Spectrum, we witness a child coming to terms with their friend passing away. What does it do to a child's mind, learning about death at such a young age? Furthermore, what does it mean for a child to learn they killed another person at such a young age? How will it affect them? With this era of helicopter parenting and constant debates about children being indoctrinated or learning more about what the real world is like, I can't help but think this is what Suda was pondering. More so the topic of death than anything else though. I can't imagine how stressful that can be to describe in the presence of a child. 
Regarding Parade, does it really need to be described? Corporate ghouls are still everywhere and taking whatever they can from any class below them. This aspect is still prevalent, where we see literal billionaires taking money from poor people, dumb people, and then trying to claim they stand against the elites of the world. Okay, that last bit isn't stated in the game. I'm just astonished that it's 2023 and I still see so many people getting duped this easily. While I can't say there's many examples of blowing up buildings full of these soulless ghouls in real life, unfortunately, the idea of protesting and doing anything you can to try tearing at these fiends is still prominent. And while not enough, there are stories that led to successfully taking some of them down a peg. It's an endless fight though. While we got to see some parasites go up in flames, more will continue to thrive and suck the life out of any individual they can. Kamui Drome, of course, has internet culture front and center. I don't think there's anyone these days that can disagree that the internet has only grown to a massive scale since the late 90s and basically has its own world that people love to live in. Not in a physical sense yet, but millions upon millions of people across the globe are obsessed with the internet and their access to it. The phrase term Terminally online is pretty common. There's also the obsession with internet figures that express themselves on many outlets in various forms. Like I said before, the idea of Sayaka Bayan becoming this digital goddess on the behest of fan obsession is something that would absolutely become prominent for years to come with an endless list of examples. And lastly, Life Cut, focused on Kamui. He serves as the bookends of this entire story, but what does he represent in the world of the 24 Wards? He wasn't just some criminal as we saw, he was an idea, a concept. His criminal persona spread throughout the wards and began affecting the public, especially after he was killed. Not unlike real life figures, criminal background or otherwise, that would become a symbol for events that change society. In other words, martyrs. Joan of Arc and Che Guevara are great examples of such. Hell, even Jesus Christ was considered a criminal back in his time. I think to Suda, Kamui represents those iconic figures, those martyrs that influenced countless people across the world and proceeded to change their societies from there. Suda was creating a case study of not just criminality, but also how one can go beyond their own lifetime to influence others. I've definitely noticed the increased need for socially aware games. I did a bit of that with the Silver Case. It's not like a documentary, but it's kind of a reflection or an analysis of criminal elements, especially violent crime. How does it occur? And that sort of thing. That's one of the major themes and one of the reasons I made the game in the first place. Kamui, even with his fake criminal background, isn't really a villain. Not only did he not kill anyone, but even the victims of what would be Kamui murders weren't exactly innocent. The only real victims would be those that were killed from a crime of passion, such as Ayami's victims. Granted, there's a chance they weren't innocent either, being close enough to Kamui that they would birth his children. Still, the whole thing is pretty ambiguous, as not only were there many of these murders set up by those of higher power, Kamui Uehara would also end up influencing actual violent crimes that he wasn't aware of. I guess you can call his existence a real gray area. Or perhaps... Silver! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Be sure, to, be sure to like and subscribe. And one last chance to reiterate, just like in real life, those that are committing some of the worst crimes are the ones that are trying to convince us they're the only ones who can stop it. Both those in higher power and the police force. Fascism in the guise of justice. It's a tale as old as the police force themselves and not something the Silver Case is shy to show off. And while we're on the subject of political analysis, there's something else I couldn't help but notice. The Silver Case serves as a heavy precursor to what Suda would present and express in Killer7. From the unique acts of crime, the heavy political messages, constant intrigue of higher-ups being in control, institutions function to groom young souls into political assets, the vague theme of the player themselves being part of the story as it's implied this whole thing is literally a video game, there's even an instance of you meeting with all these main characters in a tower as you're pacing to the conclusion of the story. Hell, I can make the case that Nezu and Kun Lan are even one and the same. And I think a lot of this was intentional, as Suda has stated in a conference back in 2007 that Killer7 and the Silver Case both had the same concept as a base. They're cut from the same cloth. Of course, I think it's fair to say the Silver Case doesn't feel as grandiose or global as Killer7. Kind of reflects on their releases, seeing as how the Silver Case was Grasshopper's first game, but would only be released in Japan, so its story dealt merely with Japan and whatever that country's politics were like back in the 90s. 
Meanwhile, Killer7 will be Grasshopper's first original game to see a rather global release, so it's appropriate that the story dealt with political conflict between various countries, most notably the United States, and focused on conflicts that span across the world. Even the protagonist does some considerable globetrotting, while also being the most diverse main character in existence. This also emphasizes how important the Silver Case was to him. Obviously, he didn't know what kind of opportunities would arrive a decade later when he made Killer7, so he wanted to express his thoughts and concerns regarding politics and different forms of control by those of higher power, most likely thinking nobody outside of Japan would ever get to experience the story that the Silver Case bore. Overall, The Silver Case is as bewildering as it is excellent. Sure, there's some things regarding it that's worth criticizing. The way it spills information can sometimes be really tedious, if not confounding. The puzzles aren't all that engaging, and how it presents itself is considerably obtuse. The game doesn't really go out of its way to make sure you understand it as this perfect circle. It's not even that clear with what it's trying to express. There are certain parts that still leave me kind of clueless, and seeing how Suda and Uka both approach writing a story, that's actually not surprising. Here's a few words from Masahi Uka, the writer of Placebo. The Silver Case is a piece of work which presents the seem-to-be logical answer, but creates inconsistency at the same time. And then someone comes up with a new piece of logic from another perspective, but it also produces a different inconsistency. It keeps going on like this and ends up with just a chaotic situation. So sometimes, I have to think about what is the logical consistency anyway. There might be some inconsistencies left over intentionally. Logic is a mere element to construct a story. It is true that if the story has any inconsistency, that might make the user stop following it. But if the work has something more important than keeping the consistency, it is the author's choice to prioritize the inconsistency. This is what I think. If any of us come up with a brilliant idea, we should rely on that rather than try to make something look good. I prefer a marvelous idea with some inconsistency rather than a logical consistency. Of course, we need to balance them well. God, from the way this is written, you can tell this is translated. I actually like this way of thinking in regards to writing and presenting a narrative. While I definitely appreciate a long story that has a consistent sense of continuity, I don't think it's detrimental if the writer's priority is an absolute logic. Like, did all of the silver case make sense? Did all of the occurrences make sense? Did all of the dialogue make perfect sense? Did Sumio being deaf and only relying on lip reading to blend into a police force inconspicuously make sense? Did Tokyo's means of researching all these cases make perfect sense? Did Tetsu avoiding repercussions from the HCU after killing their chief director despite being in the same building surrounded by special forces make perfect sense? No, absolutely not. But why does it have to? Especially if it gets in the way of telling an interesting story. Why ruin the fairy tale with facts and sound logic? I think the Silver Case is most interesting as this study on the concept of crime, the core of it. We saw different facets of society and how different kinds of crimes affected the individuals involved. What is crime? Why do people commit it? Why does it keep happening? Who does it harm or even benefit the most? Can it ever be stopped? The game poses a lot of questions to the player because it doesn't really have an end or real answers. Even at its most climactic, they make it very clear that the only thing you can really do is keep living your life and fight for what you believe in. But not without balance. Leaning so heavily on pure individuality and closing yourself from new information or simple evidence can be a slippery slope to misconceptions and a severely narrow misunderstanding of the world. I think that's the point of seizing the light. You need to find balance, not absolution. So in the end, there is no definitive answer to the silver case, and I'd argue that Suda was not trying to give a definitive answer, but instead just provide this case study on crime. With that said, I think Tetsu's words ring truer than anything else in this ordeal. Crime is crime. This analysis was not really meant to find an absolute, inarguable thread of meaning within the game. I don't think any of my videos are. Like many creatives, I don't think that is really Suda's intent. There are many aspects that can be interpreted differently. Just like with previous analyses on this channel, all I want to do is get people thinking about all these pieces more thoroughly. That is, if they choose to. 
I find the silver case to be extremely important regarding Suda's career in the industry as well. This game in 1999 is where he began creating his own identity, with the help of other talented game devs of course. All of their efforts that went into the silver case and its modest success on the original PlayStation is why Suda51 is still part of the industry to this day. From how he has spoken about this remake and having all his late 90s memories flood back into his brain, it helped him rediscover what it meant to be a game developer. He has spoken about beginning to find that spark in 2012 when he was exploring the indie scene. Perhaps this remake's production gave that spark some gas so it can light a fire inside of him. A fire that made him stop taking the backseat as producer, merely overlooking projects and getting back into the mud as a director and designer once again. While working on the silver case again, I felt like I was meeting myself from 17 years ago. In some ways I felt like that person was separate from me. I remember making the game and who I was at the time, but it still felt like it was made by a different person. I discovered things about this person that I have lost over the years. Youth, anger, a drive to do all types of things. This created a desire not to lose to my younger self. I'm gonna still push on and make great things. After this, I felt that Goichi Suda had been revived. Kill the past is a heavy theme in this game. Destroy the things that are weighing you down so you can reach enlightenment. Or, as Tetsu put it, seizing that light. Perhaps when Suda was taking in the story once again while preparing this remake, he was reminded of what needed to be done. For the better of Grasshopper as a company, for the better of Suda, for the better of his soul, he finally got up kill this past and seize that light. Coming up next, we'll be taking a trip to the beautiful and mysterious tropical island of Los Pass. Please join me next time when I analyze Flower, Sun, and Rain. Thank you so much for watching. I'd like to once again thank Sukuban NYC for sponsoring this video. How about instead of another overpriced Deku shirt printed on garbage material, turn some heads with these cool barbed wire or XOXO tees, always manufactured with high quality fabric. They've got stickers and other accessories too. The folks behind Sukuban NYC are very passionate about what they put out and prioritize making fine quality clothing with original graphics by artists they admire. And they always make sure those artists get properly supported and credited. So please check them out and consider throwing a bone in exchange for some badass clothes. I'd also like to give special thanks to James Mountain for taking the time to talk to me. I'll be uploading the interview sometime after this video. And a shout out to Kado Costa for being the voice for Suda. Please check him out. Lastly, for those still sticking around, I wanted to also say I'm going to be streaming here weekly on YouTube as much as I can. Hope you tune in and hang out once in a while. I yeah. What was it? Oh, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> as you're saying the line. He was so into it. Same as yesterday. I showed her the mail from the back. <laughs> <laughs>